next two hours, the House Rules Committee works on guidelines and rules for debate on a debt limit bill. This legislation would temporarily raise the limit on federal debt. The current total debt is $4.9 trillion. The bill would raise the debt limit to $4.97 through December and then revert to $4.8 trillion. New York Representative Gerald Solomon chairs the meeting. This uh, <coughs> meeting of the Rules Committee will come to order. Today we are here to consider a short-term de uh, debt limit extension. Uh, as we all know, the, uh, the federal government has uh, run up huge deficits over the years. It's uh, about uh, $4.9 trillion now. And uh, this uh, measure before us will uh, increase the ability of the uh, federal government to uh, to borrow at a uh, higher deficit i think of uh, 4.967 billion dollars uh, hopefully uh, when we finish the uh, the reagan revolution that is taking place here we're going to get these deficits under control and we're going to uh, stop having to do this uh, every year uh, and the american people will be glad to hear that uh, before I yield to my good friend uh, Joe Moakley, the ranking member, I'm going to uh, ask uh, Bill Archer, who is the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, who has carried uh, much of the, uh, the brunt of the, uh, uh, of the revolution on his shoulders. And Bill, we appreciate the great job that you've done, and uh, uh, we appreciate your bringing this legislation to before us. Before I uh, uh, call on you to uh, testify, let me yield to my good friend Joe Moakley. Mr. Chairman, wasn't it nice Mr. when Mr. Archie used to come up here and smile? Smile right now. <laughs> no, I don't think that's a smile. Yeah, he looks a little like the Cheshire cat to me. Uh, he can predict the outcome these days. Oh, thank you. Jesus, does that mean I have to rip up my opening statement? <laughs> <laughs> I've heard of people being put on the spot before, Joe, but... <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm very sorry to see this very important issue, the issue of whether the government of the United States defaults on its loans is being used as a political football. Never in the entire history of this country, never under either a Democrat or a Republican president, never has this country failed to pay its bills. That is, until now. So let me make it clear, unless the Congress puts politics aside, unless the Congress passes a clean debt limit extension, the United States of America will default on this loan for the first time in the history of the country. But unfortunately, that doesn't seem to matter to some of my Republican colleagues. Some of my colleagues are attaching extraneous partisan legislation to this bill that will cause very serious problems. Now, I'll be the first to say that I wish we were not raising the debt limit, but unfortunately we have to. And we should do so quickly without any legislative black, back, blackmail or political gains. Because the fiscal integrity of the United States is much too important to be sacrificed for bipartisanship. Mr. Chairman, that's my statement. I would hope that we could come out with a clean CR uh, clean debt limit rather, mm -hmm. and go forward in, in, uh, without any of these extraneous amendments that never before were attached to anything uh, resembling uh, increasing the debt limit. Well, Joe, I can uh, appreciate your having to take that position uh, as the ranking minority member of the, uh, of the Rules Committee. But as you know, uh, this, uh, this committee did grant uh, a rule which allowed for a six-week extension, uh, a continuing resolution that allowed for the government to function. That was a clean uh, continuing resolution. Uh, unfortunately, that's a great example. That's right. Well, unfortunately, uh, not much was accomplished uh, in those six weeks. And so here we are again. Uh, 
And the truth of the matter is, uh, we just ne cannot continue uh, under these circumstances to allow these deficits to accrue. And when you talk about extraneous matter, uh, I don't call uh, eliminating and reducing uh, the size of the uh, Commerce Department with 30, 37,000 employees, I don't, I don't call that extraneous. I call that what the American people want. Uh, when you talk about um, the uh, uh, trust funds and preventing, this legislation will prevent uh, the federal government, uh, the president or the administration from dipping into the Social Security trust funds to keep this government running. And that's what my constituents want. It calls for breast cancer, uh, as you know, the breast cancer and post prostate legislation, which we had in the uh, previous legislation uh, yesterday, just passed on the floor a few minutes ago. Uh, that may never become law, and consequently we have it here. That's badly needed by your family and mine, among others, uh, thousands and thousands of families across the country. Uh, when you uh, consider regulatory reform, uh, that is so badly needed by business and industry today that has a very difficult time trying to compete not only with each other in the United States because of the overburden of regulation, but to, com to compete globally with other industrialized nations. It is a terrible problem today. And that's why you find it difficult for a small business in particular to create 75% of the new jobs in America. Kids are graduating from college with no jobs. Kids are graduating from high school with no jobs, from the inner cities. This is meant to correct all that. So having said all that, Bill, let Mr. me welcome... Chairman, one, one second. I'd be glad to yield my good friend, Mr. Buckley. with my chairman, 100%. I disagree that this is the vehicle for the, those actions. Those are very important actions. Each one should be treated <laughs> by itself. But increasing the debt limit is not the place for this to occur. Well, I would just say the other alternative is to uh, not to increase the debt limit. Then the government defaults and uh, uh, people don't get paid that work for the government. Uh, people that uh, enjoy the benefits of the government, recipients of programs, uh, don't get their monthly checks. That means veterans, that means senior citizens. I think we're doing the right thing. So I think you're answering your own question. Why clutter it up with all these things and let's get it through so it passes, so we can make sure these people go to sleep tonight without worrying whether they're going to get a check. Well, when they when they see us pass this rule tonight, they're going to know they're going to get that check. Mr. Archer. I turn my mic on here. I, I commented to our friend Joe Moakley that he is a good man, and I genuinely meant that. But good men are sometimes wrong. And um, I know that to be true because I've been wrong before in my life. Well, that's reassuring. <laughs> But I, I must say that the purpose of this legislation is to do just the reverse of what you said. It is to prevent this country from potentially defaulting. And as we know, on November the 15th, if there's not settlement on a new issue of federal securities, um, we will really be in trouble. So this legislation permits the Treasury to continue to operate until December the 12th. Uh, without any untoward effects, without any potential of default. What it does do, however, is say that on December the 12th, as the chairman said, that there can be no disinvestment or a failure to invest the trust funds. Uh, the Treasury cannot continue to try to bootstrap this government by invading the Social Security trust fund, potentially undermining and jeopardizing that fund and Governor it's... Neal, didn't we do yeah. that uh, before protecting... You know, we talked about it. I, I will say to my friend, we talked about it, but in reality, we never did anything. And legally today, it is possible for the Secretary of the Treasury uh, to invade the Social Security Trust Fund. You remember the great hoopla that occurred back in the 80s when we were in this situation once before and how it distressed the senior citizens uh, as a possible undermining of the sanctity of that trust fund. So, yes, our legislation does prohibit that, except for the purpose of paying the benefits that need to be paid out of that trust fund, so that those benefits can continue to be paid after December the 12th. Now, now what is the purpose of this? The purpose of this is to bring pressure on the executive branch and the congressional branch to come together and to resolve the, the differences. That is the only way the country moves forward. Unfortunately, up to this point, as the chairman has said, uh, that has not occurred. 
Uh, I'm sorry to say that in the 23 hours that our speaker and majority leader were with the president on the trip to Israel, there was not a moment of discussion about this. That was a perfect opportunity for the president to call him into his compartment on Air Force One and begin the discussion. There was not one word of discussion. We have to find a method to force both of these parts of our government to come together and to resolve this difference. And so, yes, it is a drop-dead date on December the 12th. And that gives adequate time for us first to send the appropriations bills and the reconciliation bill to the president, and additional time to sit down and negotiate if, in fact, he vetoes those bills, which he has said he's going to do. Uh, we stand ready to do that. We ask three things, that the president commit to a balanced budget in seven years based on CBO numbers, not on rosy scenario of OMB, and to do so without a tax increase, and to sit down with us with those parameters and negotiate for the future of our children. I had a grandchild born last week, and I'm, I'm, I'm just delighted and excited for that little boy. But the day he came into this world, he carries on his shoulders a responsibility for $187,000 of interest on the debt that we have already accumulated. Not to speak of future debt. If we don't get this budget balanced now, that number goes up. And that is totally unfair to our children and to their children. I know the gentleman from Massachusetts agrees with me. We must bring a stop to this, and it will not come easily. So yes, there is the drop-dead date of December the 12th. And I believe that, if, that individuals of good faith who want to balance this budget can get together and can resolve these differences and have something agreed and signed into law. This, in effect, is a down payment on a balanced budget for the benefit of our children and their children and the debt that we continue to heap upon their heads. We have already, in the House, approved a permanent debt ceiling, but it was tied in with a balanced budget resolution. And we must force this ultimate balanced budget. It ensures, this bill ensures the financial integrity of government trust funds that are invested in government debt obligations subject to the debt limit. And it does give targeted authority to issue new debt in order to ensure continued payment, as I said, of the Social Security benefits, uh, civil service retirement benefits, military retirement <coughs> benefits, railroad retirement benefits, and so on. Um, members on both sides of the aisle have long agreed that Social Security payroll taxes go into trust funds dedicated to one purpose alone, not to be manipulated uh, in the event of fiscal difficulties on the part of the Treasury. Those funds are there to pay benefits to the retired, not to serve as a vehicle for trying to solve a debt crisis. Taxpayers and beneficiaries alike must be able to have confidence that the trust funds will be preserved intact and earn all the interest to them and that benefits be paid on time, and this bill assures that. Therefore, Mr. Chairman, I elongated my statement. I apologize for that, but I appreciate the opportunity to come before you and urge that this committee report out a rule. And by the way, Mr. Gibbons told me that he was not going to be able to be here, but I had his proxy. It's a very unusual moment. Um, and, and I'm going to ask you, as usual, as we do from the Ways and Means Committee, to provide a closed rule for the consideration of this bill on the floor, that the bill be considered as read and waiving all points of order, one hour of debate equally divided, and one motion to recommit with or without instructions. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> Chairman Archer, again, thank you for uh, the great job you've done. It's been uh, a very, very difficult 10 months, and uh, uh, you are certainly to be commended. Uh, let me ask you, how much time uh, do you think we would need for general debate on this uh, well, I, I suggested, Mr. Mr. Chairman, that um, I thought one hour equally divided would be adequate, plus the time for the motion to recommit. Um, should you elect uh, to have a larger amount of time, certainly I would accept that.
that would be the minimum. Well, there is, uh, there is the possibility that uh, the uh, majority leader uh, might request uh, a, uh, an amendment be made in order uh, that he would determine, uh, or his designee, uh, perhaps dealing with regulatory reform. If that were to happen, uh, do you have any feeling about how much time might be allowed for that? I think that would be totally your, your decision within okay. your discretion. We thank you for coming before us. Mr. Quillen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As usual, Mr. Archer, you do an outstanding job. I think we do face a crisis, and we must face it, and we must solve it. Normally, I don't favor increasing debt limits. I think the government should use the right decisions going along, but this administration has not. And this year, we have faced that problem under your leadership and others in the Congress, and I'm sure we'll be successful. Hopefully, the rule can be granted and we can solve this uh, problem early tomorrow, and I congratulate you on the fine job you did. Thank you. Mr. Moakley. My friend. Uh, did I understand you to say that, that uh, Mr. Gibbons agrees with you? He's giving you his on, proxy? On, on the request that I made for the rule. Oh, oh, I was going to go out and buy a hearing aid. All right, thank you. you do, I disagree with you. You do a wonderful job. You work hard. But I just disagree with you. Mr. Uh, Dreyer. Well, I would echo the uh, remarks totally of Mr. Moakley, except I would say that I totally agree with you. <laughs> Mr. Bielenson. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Just, just two or three questions to you, Bill, Mr. Chairman. Um, you, you, you were describing earlier on in the requirements of this bill that, or at least I thought that's what you were saying, that uh, you're trying to get the president and, the, and our leadership here together with respect to agreeing, for example, on a seven-year course of, of getting the budget deficit down to a balanced budget. Are, are, any, are any of those requirements in the bill itself? In, in reading the, the uh, Rules Committee Republican summary no, of it, it, I don't I see don't it. I don't think it would be appropriate to have it in the bill, okay. so the, 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 but, but certainly... The, that's the, your intent. The pressure that will come from the drop-dead date of December the 12th... Okay, no, I understand. I, I just will, was looking for it in the bill. ...will cause both sides to have to come together. I understand. If I may, uh, if this is not an unfair question, what extraneous matters might one find in this bill? Um, do you have your Department of Commerce? I don't believe there in are any. Here? I don't believe there are anything that you would call extraneous, uh, other than the items that I mentioned, which is a limitation on the disinvestment of the trust funds. Right. So, so all of those, all of those legislative matters, in a sense, are related one way or another to your to your debt limitation. That's, you, you don't have the Department right. of Commerce in here. No. You don't yet have regulatory no. form, reform, no. which I, I think our friend no. from Pennsylvania no. may be asking for no. shortly, and perhaps the, no. the distinguished majority no. leader. Um, so there's no other legislative, unrelated legislative. There are Those no really other... are outside the jurisdiction of our committee. Right. That's really very nice that you come to us with that, this stuff in it. The ways... Both side of you well, are... No, 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 no. I'm, 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 <laughs> He's I'm on your side, nice, Mr. Mr. Nice guy. But it's, I mean, it's really nice because we've had a couple of committees, uh, names I won't mention, recently come up with truly extraneous things in them. Let me just ask you one more thing, Mr. Chairman, if I may. Um, it provides that after December 12th, the debt limit would revert to $4.8 trillion, which is beneath the present, the current law limit of $4.9 trillion. Did you explain to us why that? That fits right into the scenario that I mentioned, which is we want to be sure that December the 12th is a final date and that everybody understands that so that we will come together prior to that date and solve this problem. Well, my question to you, I guess, then is, will our debt exceed $4.8 trillion at that time? I mean, will you be coming down I below it? it? I assume it will. I mean, we, we, we have so put it up to 9.67 now, Mr. Rubin. Four, four, nine, six, seven, in order to get us beyond That's November the, the 15th crisis and the first part of December crisis. And uh, after that time, if we have not resolved this problem, it does go back to 4.8. So you're proposing, if I may put it a little strongly, to ensure that we're in default 
if, no, if, if agreements have no, not been reached no, by the 12th? No, no, this does not assure default on anything. It assures that we will resolve this problem before we ever get to a position of being in default. No, I understand. I'm coming at it from a different angle, I suppose, because I'm concerned, as many are, including just as many people in your party as in ours, maybe more, since you have more in your party than we do in ours, uh, about the possibility of default. It's something we want to avoid, if at all possible. I, I wish to avoid default. Right, but going back to 4.8 trillion doesn't seem to help. Or am I wrong? It certainly helps us to resolve this debt issue for the long term and to get to a to balanced budget. To your satisfaction, budget. but maybe not to the bottom. And in numbers. between now and December the 12th, there will be no possibility that we'll be in default. No, until then. That's right. And, and, and the pressure will be December the 12th as a date that both of us, the Congress and the President, have to be concerned about in a very real way so that there can be no readjustment or manipulation to try to postpone that date. We must resolve our differences by then. If, however, we haven't, I take it under certain circumstances, perhaps the more reasonable amongst you might agree to another very short extension so that negotiations I, could continue. I, I cannot predict that. I I, will I'm say sure you can't. That, I, I hope the president will sit down with us in good faith and negotiate a balanced budget in seven well, years by CBO numbers without tax increase. Well, all, I, all we can agree to is that we hope and expect that he will sit down and negotiate with you in good faith. You know, whether he'll meet all of your conditions or whether he should meet all of your conditions, you know, remains to be well, seen. No. But so long as you're sitting, as you, I'm sure you shall, you will, in good faith, I'm sure that one way or another we'll resolve this to the benefit of the nation. Mm. Would, uh, would my good friend yield for a moment? To you, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Sure. Let me, uh, let me just speak for... You're not going to speak about the Reagan Revolution, are you? <laughs> well, I, I, I love to do that. I know you do. But uh, love to the, the interrupted Reagan Revolution. But uh, let me just say this. For those of us that have pursued uh, relentlessly a balanced budget for so many years, and I've been here for 17 years now, the reason that we are reverting back to 4.8 trillion is because every day now that we are in the new fiscal year we are losing money because we are on a glide path to a balanced budget and we are going to stick to that come hell or high water now we're already into two months that means to stick to that glide path if we continue just to go back to 4.9 what have we done we have lost money and savings and we are not going to do this this is to show that we are serious and no matter what, we are going to balance that budget by the year 2002. Well, and that's exactly why it's there. And I'm not so sure that we will pass another CR if there is a disagreement. Okay. We all have to get serious and get down to serious business of sticking to this glide path of seven years, Tony. And that's, well, no, that's I, really why it's there. No, I understand. And it, it, it helps me understand why it's there. And I appreciate right. that. I'll say just I'm one, being one more thing. We believe, and we too are, um, serious about your are getting to a balanced budget in seven years. Right. And I've I know said you on many, are. Well, yes. I, you know, all of us have given you a lot of credit for, for being serious about it. We wish you'd gone about it somewhat differently, but perhaps, you know, eventually we will go about it a little bit uh, differently. I'm sure we'll get there with your help, with a lot of help from you all in the next seven years. I, it's just that all of us want to ensure that along the way we don't, we don't stumble over ourselves and, and, and bring um, problems upon this, this nation, which all of us love uh, inadvertently. So I can, I can only hope that a, of course, the president will negotiate in good, in good faith, and, and B, I'm sure our Republican leadership will continue to also, or will, when the time comes, and hopefully we can avert these crises, and hopefully, too, you won't, uh, you know, insist on every last detail the president, you know, comes your way. I mean, there's going to be, have to, have to be a little give and take in this, too, of course. There can be no give and take on a balanced budget in seven years by CBO but, numbers well, without just, tax increases. Well. But there's a lot of parameter within that. We can speak to the CBO, you mean? Yeah. We can. I'm, okay, fine. Thanks, the Mr. gentleman will recall in February the 17th in 1993 when the president made his first speech to the Congress that he got a standing ovation when he said he wasn't going to use the uncertain numbers of OMB. He was going to use the certain numbers of CBO, and he submitted his first budget to this Congress based on CBO numbers and was applauded bipartisan. Now he has drifted away from that and gone to Rosie's Rosie scenario. He has put her back on the stage again and using OMB numbers while we are using the tough numbers of CBO. 
I think he found Rosie on one of your old stages. <laughs> we understand. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just point out to Mr. Archer and others that uh, Tony Bielenson is, uh, is going to be leaving us uh, after this term, and uh, he has been one of the most thoughtful uh, members and, and the most uh, highly respected members of this, uh, not only this committee, but this body. We're, I would we're really going to miss him. I would agree with that. Mr. Goss. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I uh, understand the role you requested, Mr. Archer. I think it's entirely appropriate. I cannot find myself uh, sitting here anticipating with pleasure voting for uh, raising the debt ceiling, uh, but I can do it knowing that we are going to balance the budget. If somebody removes the means for us to get to balancing that budget, I have no one way to retract my vote to extend the debt ceiling. Consequently, I applaud you on your approach to making sure we get down to business, because we have to. Thank you. Mr. Frost of Texas, another Texan. I have a, I have a question about uh, some testimony that we are going to hear shortly from another Texan, uh, Mr. Stockman. Uh, it's my understanding that Mr. Stockman uh, is going to ask that an amendment uh, be made in order regarding home equity lending in the state of Texas. Uh, this amendment was um, attached to another piece of legislation which is currently pending, as you may be aware. And my question to you is, uh, what is your position on his request that uh, his amendment be made in order uh, uh, to this particular piece I, of legislation? I'm not going to attempt to prejudge any amendment that may be requested by any member. Uh, I have made my statement to the committee. Our committee has reported out a debt ceiling bill. I have asked for a closed rule. Uh, it will be within the committee's determination as to what they want to do beyond that. Well, by asking for a closed rule, uh, then you are asking this committee not to make any amendments in order. I think that is the definition of a closed rule. I just wanted to be clear on that. and That, uh, that is my request. Mm -hmm. That is a request I will make on all such bills coming out of the Ways and Means Committee. Mm -hmm. um, is... Uh, well, I, I, think the, I think you've made your position clear, and um, this, this committee in the past, uh, when there has been a Democratic chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, generally... By the way, if I change that, I would lose Mr. Gibbons' proxy. Uh, in the past, uh, when we had a, a Democratic chairman of your committee appear before us, it's my recollection that he always asked for closed rules also, that um, you are in that tradition. Um, and that generally this committee has uh, uh, honored those requests from the Ways and Means Committee. Uh, there was an issue a number of years ago um, in which uh, I, had a, I personally had a difference of opinion with the then chairman of the Ways and Means Committee uh, over an issue involving industrial development bonds. Um, and we went round and round on that for some time, as you may recall. Uh, ultimately, uh, we did grant a closed rule on that issue. So it would not be unusual if we were to honor your request here today. Thank you. Mrs. Price of Ohio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as always, um, Chairman Archer, you've done magnificent work here. There are so many members who just abhor the thought of voting to raise the debt limit. And it's a, a very, very difficult vote uh, among a number of us. And uh, you have made it a lot easier with the provisions that you've crafted here. And, I applaud your efforts, and uh, I wish you all the best. Thank you. Mr. Hall of Ohio. Mr. Chairman, I thank you. I, I just wanted to ask Mr. Archer about Mr. Geekus has an excellent amendment. Uh, it's a bill that he's introduced, I think, a couple of years now, which would really, in my opinion, put a stop to the kind of games that are played up here with people and with the government and with the whole country by, you know, if we can't pass our 13 appropriation bills that last year's budget would kick in automatically uh, and, and or the Senate or the House bill which passes during that term the lowest of the figures, I guess. I, I'm explaining it in a in general way and I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. I think is. I think his bill and his idea is an excellent idea. I hope someday, I hope someday we can adopt his amendment as a law. Uh, if you're opposed to offering any amendments to this bill, it'll probably end this conversation. But what, how do you feel about his, 
his idea. Well, I'm, I, I'm not familiar with it in detail, but I will tell you that Mr. Geekus is a most respected member of this Congress and someone whom I greatly admire. And he is a very thoughtful, very down-to-earth, very common-sense individual. And I suspect it probably is a good proposal, but I'm not familiar with it in detail. Okay, thank you. Mr. Uh, diaz Ballard of uh, Florida. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Archer, I am uh, aware of the extraordinary difficulty of uh, the work uh, that you uh, uh, have and are performing and simply wanted to commend you uh, for your work product under extraordinarily, extraordinarily difficult situation, uh, circumstances. I have no questions, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Uh, who's over here? Mr. McGinnis. Hey, Mr. Colorado. Chairman. Uh, just to the chairman, uh, Mr. Archer, you know, we're in the final quarter here, and there are a lot of people that uh, I, I think would walk off the field. You are committed to stay on the field. You're going to stay on the field till the final bell rings, and uh, uh, we're behind you. I think you're doing a great job, and it takes. It is this kind of commitment and this kind of uh, solidarity that's going to get this, bal uh, this budget balanced. Short of that, it isn't going to happen. So I commend you and appreciate your efforts. I thank the gentleman. Mrs. Waldholtz of Utah. I'll just echo what has already been said. That it's very difficult for many of us to think about having to raise uh, the debt limit of our country. And by combining that with the requirement that we balance, I think that allows us to do what we need to do to keep our nation solvent, but at the same time know that we're ensuring its long-term solvency. So I appreciate your efforts. Thank you. The ranking minority member, uh, Mr. Moakley, would like one more crack at you, right. Bill. Not really practical. Uh, I, I still have a misunderstanding. You said you had a proxy from from Sam Gibbons. For, well, I don't have a written proxy. For, I, uh, for Mr. Gibbons role. talked to me and said that he would not uh, be wishes. appearing before the committee, but that he has supported a close rule. Well, but I have a statement from Gibbons saying that his amendment would replace the short-term increase in the debt limit with the long-term increase the amount of 5.5 .5 trillion on and on Maybe on. I misunderstood him. Okay. Well, I, I, I just want to make but sure I, I didn't misunderstand. You know, I, he did say he wasn't going to appear, so I assume he's not going to urge that that amendment well, uh, be but, made in order. But his statement here shows that he's not in favor of a closed rule. Would you uh, like to submit that well, for the record? Yeah, please. <laughs> Without objection, yeah. it will appear yeah, in the record. I, you know, I, I sort of said that in jest, but he did tell me he was not going to be here and that he had no problem with my... Well, last time I saw Sam him. Gibbons, he was far from being in jest. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe you've got a way of tickling his <laughs> funny bone. He, he, uh, he did tell me he would not be appearing today and he was not going to make any objection to my request for... I guess he through. probably feels it's going to go through anyway, but he, he did in writing. Well, he offered an amendment. In, in fairness, I will say, he did offer an amendment in the committee that okay. he felt very strongly about, and the amendment went down. I'm sure he does He does not uh, support the bill right. as it came out of the committee. No, I you, did you not, mean, not mean to imply that. No, you didn't, mean, you didn't do that, but you did say that he favored a closed rule, which is asking for amendment just flies in the face of that statement. Gentlemen, if we could move on, it's uh, getting late and we have a lot of witnesses. And uh, Bill, we really do appreciate your coming before us again. Uh, you do a great job and uh, keep up the good work. Thank you for your Thank courtesy. you for coming. The uh, next witness uh, from the uh, Ways and Means Committee is uh, the Honorable L.F. Payne from Virginia. And Lou, if you would uh, feel free to summarize, your entire statement will appear in the record without objection. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I appreciate uh, you giving me, me giving me an opportunity to speak on behalf of my amendment to the bill providing for the temporary increase in the public debt limit. My amendment would increase the debt limit until the later of December 12, 1995, or 30 days after the budget reconciliation bill is presented to the president for action. It does not include any restrictions on the Treasury Department's ability to manage debt during this period. And I'm offering this because of two strong beliefs that I hold. First, I believe that it is absolutely intolerable for the United States to default on its debt. And I agree with then Secretary Baker, who said in 1985, and I quote, it would be an absolute disgrace if the United States defaulted for the first time in its over 200 year history. Any default will have swift and severe implications both domestically and internationally. 
uh, debt obligation of the United States have been accepted throughout the world as the model of risk-free investment. Millions of investors rely on uh, treasury securities as safe and stable repositories for their wealth and liquidity and, uh, and count on the interest they receive for a myriad of, of needs. It, if uh, default occurs, the impact on financial markets would be significant and likely it would be enduring. Default would likely have a prolonged and far-reaching consequences on the value of the dollar, domestic, foreign stock, bond, futures, and options markets. The interest cost of the United States uh, government would be affected, and home mortgage rates, many of which are indexed to uh, interest rates paid on treasury securities, as well as consumer loans. Uh, an increase of only 10 basis points in the treasury rate on treasury securities would increase the budget deficit by almost $15 billion over the next six years. N none of this then benefits the United States or any of our citizens. And I think we're all in agreement about that first principle. I haven't heard anybody say, uh, and certainly the Chair Chairman Archer didn't suggest anything different. The second principle that I am attempting to further through this amendment is one that I share with the leadership of the House and the Senate and the majority of members in the House and the Senate, and that is to facilitate the adoption of a reconciliation bill which will lead to a balanced budget by the year 2002. I'm a founding member of the Conservative Democratic Coalition, which strongly supports and advocates getting this country's fiscal house in order. However, I believe this historic effort is one which will likely take more time than is being permitted under this Republican bill. I believe that balancing the budget by the year 2002 is too important an issue for this country to provide less than 30 days after the bill has reached the President's desk. I think this amendment represents a very fair proposal. It gives all of us 30 days after the President has received the reconciliation bill to work out our policy differences and to achieve our shared goals. Because my amendment does not include any of the restrictions in the Treasury Department's ability to manage the debt during this period, it grants to this administration exactly the same authority that has been given to every previous administration operating uh, under similar conditions. I believe that keeping the debt ceiling extension clean of partisan distractions is essential if we are to work together to reach a balanced budget, which is what the American public has told us that they want not a Republican or Democratic effort to reorder our spending priorities, but a bipartisan effort to bring fiscal responsibility to our government spending. And if you believe that there still is hope for bipartisan cooperation on our nation's budget, then I would urge you to support this amendment and allow me to offer this uh, when this bill is taken up on the floor. And thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Mr. Payne, we... Uh we appreciate on our side of the aisle uh, your participation with the uh, with the conservative Democrats, and uh, and I know that you supported a great uh, many of the contract for America items, as many of your your so-called blue dog groups uh, did, and uh, uh, we really do appreciate that. Uh, I, for one, would like to support your amendment. Uh, uh, the problem is, it uh, it says that. Uh, uh, the budget reconciliation bill is presented to the president instead of saying signed by the president. I have an amendment which uh, is some of the extraneous matter that will be uh, uh, self-executed into the rule, uh, which says, and I'll just take a minute to read it to you, it says, with the enactment of this act, the president and the Congress together commit to enacting legislation in calendar year 1995 to achieve a balanced budget as scored by the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office not later than the fiscal year 2002. And the second part of the, uh, the amendment says, the Congress affirms that it will not enact legislation providing for a further increase in the permanent statutory limit on the public debt unless the President signs into law the balanced budget legislation referred to in subsection A. And I guess the difference in mine and yours is that, uh, uh, that uh, the president has to sign uh, this CR saying that he will live up to uh, the balanced budget within the seven years. And if he did that, I would be glad to sit here and put out uh, continuing resolutions uh, for the next uh, two months, uh, right up until Christmas, uh, as long as we were on that glide path and it were irreversible uh, by the man's word. And we would certainly take him at his word. Uh, 
that's, uh, I know your amendment is commendable, but uh, I'm afraid if we, uh, if we allowed your amendment, it would just take the pressure off uh, of the president and off of the Congress, too, because we've got some Republicans who I'm a little upset with who, who aren't too committed to that glide path, uh, just like you have a lot of Democrats on your side of the aisle that are not, are not committed to that glide path. So uh, I appreciate your sincerity, and uh, as usual, uh, I try, and this committee tries to always treat you much more fairly than you were treated under the previous leadership, where people of your uh, persuasion and mine uh, were gagged quite often. And uh, we always welcome you here, and we'll always try to give you consideration. Will the, uh, will the chairman yield? I'd be glad to yield my good friend uh, from Texas. I wanted to pursue a matter, because uh, I'm not sure I understood exactly what the chairman said. Um, there are going to be, I gather there are going to be several amendments that are going to be self-executed into the rule? We haven't determined that yet, but uh, there's that possibility. We're going to have other testimony in a few minutes about that subject. Um, so this would, uh, this would technically avoid the objection made by the chairman uh, when but he asked which for chairman? a closed rule. Archer, Mr. Archer. Mm -hmm. uh, he asked for a closed rule, but of course amendments that are self-executed into the rule by the Rules Committee uh, then become part of the uh, text. Uh, the text which goes to the floor under a closed rule. That is correct. So that uh, people testifying before this committee uh, about a various amendments could have hoped that they would make your list of self-executed self amendments uh, well, in order to avoid the closed rule issue. As I look at the list of those uh, waiting to testify, they're optimists, and uh, I think they, they would stand a pretty good chance, they think. At, at what point uh, will the chairman indicate to the members of the committee uh, which amendments uh, it's his intention to uh, self-execute? Well, we, we don't know. I want to hear the testimony from the, uh, from the witnesses, and, uh, and we'll, we'll discuss it as we go along, if that's all right. Will there, uh, will there be, uh, after we've heard all the testimony, will there be a, a break while this matter is determined, or will we go straight to the... Uh, to the consideration well, to vote on the rule. Uh, I've had members on both sides of the aisle that, uh, that want to expedite this, uh, this rule and get it moving, and uh, uh, we'll take uh, your, cons your thoughts into consideration. If you want a, s a short break, we could have one, or uh, if you don't feel it's necessary after all the testimony, we could move right to it, perhaps. Mr. Chairman. We have several different options prepared uh, subject to whatever we decide on. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. When will we know uh, the, the period of optimism is over and the period of realism sets in. I'd say in about 15 minutes with the cooperation of the members of the panel here. Is that okay? Okay. Mr. 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 Payne, I'm sorry. To yes, you. I'd like to just respond briefly to what you said. I think one of the concerns I have and I think others share is that I know it's the intent now of the majority to have a reconciliation bill on the president's desk by next Friday, as yes. I understand. Next, However, next Thursday night. Next Thursday night. However, that may or may not happen depending on, I understand the conference has not yet met and there are many issues that have to be resolved. If in fact this is delayed and if Thanksgiving comes in uh, into play and this is then done sometime late in November, early in December, it, it could mean that the bill would be presented to the president in late November, early December, with then December 12th being the time that the U.S. government would go into default if, in fact, he has not signed that bill or some similar bill. And it seems to me this matter is just too important in this country for us not to give it an appropriate amount of time. And that's all this amendment suggests, is that it be given an appropriate amount of time, which is 30 days to uh, have to look at the bill, to do whatever negotiation is necessary, and then to sign it within a 30-day period. We've been working on this now for almost 11 months. Yeah. 30 days, it seems, is an appropriate amount of time to, to resolve it. Well, Mr. Payne, if I thought for a minute that, uh, that we, this was going to drag on through Thanksgiving and into the early part of December, uh, it might lend more credence to your amendment. But uh, let me assure you, since uh, uh, Majority Leader Dole and uh, Speaker Gingrich uh, got off the plane from Israel when they were at uh, Mr. Rabin's uh, uh, funeral, uh, they have been working diligently on putting the final touches on the reconciliation bill. There are only a couple of issues, one of which happened to uh, deal with me and my dairy problems, and, uh, uh, and we're that far away from, uh, from resolving those problems. And I assure you that by Thursday night, before we adjourn, that uh, the reconciliation bill will have passed both houses. Well, and if that's so, and it's on the President's desk the next day, the 17th, all this amendment would do 
is simply extend from December 12th to December 17th. That's what that, 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 that day, which seems to me to be a de minimis change in mm -hmm. in the intent of, of the legislation. Well, your amendment is offered with good intentions, I'm sure. Did uh, are there questions on this side of the uh, of the witness, well, Mr. Quillen? Mr. Chairman, there's no there are no questions, but uh, I want to congratulate you, along as the chairman did, for your devotion and your real expertise in what's going on. You do a, a great, an outstanding job. I think it's unusual to have someone before the committee from the opposite party so dedicated to a balanced budget, and so dedicated to the cause that this government must turn itself around. So my congratulations. Well, I appreciate that, and I'd like to say about this amendment, it was brought up in the Ways and Means Committee, and every single Democrat voted for this uh, amendment, so it's not a small number of Democrats, but I think a large number of, of people who'd be very interested in an approach like this. Thank you. Mr. Moakley. No questions. Good job. Any uh, further questions from this side? Any questions from this side? Mr. Bielens. Just very briefly, if I may, Mr. Chairman, first of all, to tell our colleague from Virginia that I, and I'm sure all of us up here, find his amendment to be very thoughtful, helpful, and sensible. Proposal, and I, I wish we meaning our friends over here in the majority were free to adopt it or at least make it in order. And secondly, just to say very briefly to you, Mr. Chairman, our friend, I want to be clear about one thing, Mr. Solomon from upstate New York. Um, the vast majority, just so you know, and I'm not being argumentative here, the vast majority of us on this side of the aisle have no problem at all with your seven-year glide path. We, we, we like that idea. I hope the President does. Uh, I think he probably does. But our argument is, just so people understand it, is the way you get there. I mean, we believe there are other, better, alternative ways of, of reaching it, including, of course, as you know, you know, not having to find the extra money that you all have to find, cut things more deeply in order to pay for a tax cut. But, but we, don't have any, we don't have any arguments, the great majority of us, with a seven-year glide path. I just don't want people to misunderstand that. And because of that, and because I think the administration generally is in agreement, at least with that, although not again with the specifics, as we, we aren't, and some of your own folks aren't, um, I do think that uh, our friend Mr. Payne's amendment would be a very useful and helpful addition to this, uh, to this bill. Thank you. Are there any further questions of the witness? If not, uh, Lewis, we really appreciate you coming before us and uh, keep up your good work. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I'm going to call a uh, tandem uh, group, if I could, uh, next, uh, because they will be dealing with uh, issues that they would wish to self-execute into the rule. The uh, first, uh, if they would come forward together, the Honorable Robert S. Walker of Pennsylvania uh, and the Honorable Richard Chrysler of Michigan. Uh, I'm not self-executing. Oh, no. That's right. I beg your pardon. Why don't you, the two of you come forward and discuss your, your, your uh, amendments together, and then we'll, it will be nice. In case they have questions of both of you, it will save a lot of time. Fine. Sure. Mr. Walker, if uh, you would proceed first, uh, please feel free to summarize, and your entire statement will appear in the record without objection. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, Mr. Chairman, I uh, make this request on behalf of the majority leader and the House leadership that I be able to offer an amendment for myself and for Chairman Bliley to provide a comprehensive regulatory reform uh, amendment on the floor. The amendment is a good faith combination of House and Senate bills. The amendment uses S-343, uh, the Dole Johnson bill, as its base text. That version did garner 58 votes in the Senate in July. The House version received 277 votes as H.R. 9 of the contract uh, with America earlier in the year. I ask the amendment be made in order with 40 minutes of debate equally divided and controlled by an opponent uh, and a proponent. The purpose of the amendment is to provide a uniform guidance for all federal agencies to conduct scientifically objective and unbiased risk, risk assessments in an economically sensible way. This is accomplished by assessing risks fairly and communicating them effectively to the public, analyzing costs as they relate to the benefits, creating a systematic program for peer review. And, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, in an era of such tough budget yep. realities, policymakers need to make choices and set priorities to concentrate scarce dollars where they will do the most good and analyze alternatives to achieve the goal of public safety at the lowest possible cost. At this critical point in our effort to change the way Washington works, we believe we have a unique opportunity to move this consensus reform package now. Uh, this has been uh, something where there's been a lot of bipartisanship in both the House and the Senate. 
we think this is a good opportunity to get it moving. And uh, after discussions with the Senate leadership about this matter, uh, I would ask that the amendment be made in order. Well, Rob, thank you very much. And we can go to Richard Chrysler of Michigan now. And uh, Richard, again, feel free to summarize your statement. It will be appear in the record without objection. Mr. Chairman, members of the Rules Committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify this evening on this important amendment to the H.R. 2586, a bill to provide a temporary increase in the public debt limit and for other purposes. The election of one year ago today gave this Congress a clear mandate for a smaller and more efficient and more focused federal government. One of the first steps we can take towards right-sizing the government is by dismantling the Department of Commerce. Our budget res resolution agreed to by both the House and the Senate called for the elimination of the Department of Commerce. This amendment provides a step-by-step -step plan for the orderly dismantling of this department. Mr. Chairman, as the head of the task force that spent the last several months studying the department, I can say that the plan in this amendment is a common sense roadmap to a government that costs less and works better. It eliminates the unnecessary programs of the department consolidates the duplicative programs, it privatizes those programs that can be better performed by the private sector, and it streamlines the beneficial programs. The department's own inspector general calls the Department of Commerce a loose collection of more than 100 programs, while the General Accounting Office reports that Commerce shares its mission with 71 other federal agencies or offices. A recent Business Week poll found that senior business executives support the dismantling of the Commerce by a two-to-one margin. If the Commerce Department were truly the voice for business, it would support a cut in the capital gains tax, regulatory reform, tort reform, and most importantly, a balanced budget. Yet the Department is opposed to all of these. Our plan to dismantle the Commerce will eliminate this needless duplication and overlapping bureaucracy by eliminating 40 programs and saving taxpayers billions of dollars over the next seven years, a significant down payment on our promise of a balanced budget. This amendment gives business the ally it deserves in the federal government and the taxpayers their money's worth. I urge the Rules Committee to make this amendment in order and would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Well, I thank both of you uh, for bringing this matter to the attention of the, uh, of the Rules Committee. Uh, I, for one, strongly support uh, both of your issues. Uh, I've already spoken earlier this, uh, this evening on regulatory reform and, um, and the Commerce Committee uh, uh, abolishment as well. So I won't bother to repeat those questions, but I would Commerce yield. Department, I think you better say right Commerce uh, Department. <laughs> well, since I'm speaking for Mr. Bliley here, I would hate to uh, see the. the well, I, I might, I might just point out that uh, two, uh, two members of the uh, of the speakers, uh, three members of the Speaker's Task Force, to uh, rearrange these committees and to abolish a lot of them. Or, David Dreyer, who was chaired, chaired the committee, and uh, Bob Walker, myself. So, uh, you know, we might consider that too later. Yeah, who knows? Here, <laughs> it'll it'll shrink the size I of the not government. Associate myself with your remarks. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Quillen. No question, but congratulations to both of you. Mr. Moakley. No question. Any questions from this side? Mr. Dreyer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to congratulate both of you and make, uh, make it very clear that what we're talking about here is a separate amendment that would be included. And I don't, I, I missed part of your testimony. I don't, uh, if, if, I mean, I just think it's important that we clarify that, that uh, exactly what your request is of this committee. My request is for a separate amendment that would, in fact, uh, have uh, 40 minutes of debate. Uh, and uh, where the House would decide whether or not to include this matter in uh, the uh, debt limit legislation that moves forward to the Senate. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Mr. Well, Bielanson? Just one quick one, Mr. Chairman, only to say, really, comment more than anything else. Our not knowing what, what you, our Chairman, is going to offer later uh, leads us to not know whether we should be arguing about, you know, or making statements about these particular proposals. I mean, most of us think there would be a mistake and be improper for, for these or any other extraneous matters, if I may so describe them, to be included in the bill. Um, be bad for the country, I think, because it would make it that much more difficult for your leadership and our leadership and the president to come to agreement on, on an extension of the debt limit. And the other things that Mr. Archer and the others spoke so eloquently uh, about, and to be frank about it, I've said this before, and it is presumptuous of me, I think it would be a serious mistake politically for our friends on your side of the aisle. The American people do not understand these kinds of things. And if you stick to the debt limit extension related stuff that the Ways and Means Committee has put in there, even though some, uh, 
and Democrats can have, I think, quite properly objections to it. Um, they're not things which will offend the American people who are thinking, who are, you know, will th think that you're simply tr trying to solve the debt limit problem in, in, in your own way. Um, but when you start putting other stuff in, it makes it easy for us to argue against it. It makes it clear to the folks out there that uh, we're playing games here again. And I don't think it helps any of us, to be frank about it. And I also don't, help, I don't think it helps us uh, solve the problems we, we have to solve in the next couple of weeks. Well, if I could just uh, <clears throat> say to the gentleman uh, where I come from in the, in the state of New York, we have, uh, over the last uh, 20 years, we have lost hundreds of thousands of manufacturing jobs uh, to other parts of the country because we in particular are so overtaxed and overburdened. We lead the, uh, the rest of the uh, 50 states, uh, 49 states in, in those categories. And we need, business and industry needs regulatory relief so bad. Uh, and again, uh, when you speak to the, uh, to the Commerce Department, uh, I think it's become common knowledge that the Commerce Department, uh, as Dick Chrysler has so uh, ably uh, spoken to before, you know, when they first began, uh, they were um, a business advocate. In other words, meant to enhance business and to help create jobs. And uh, over the years, they have just ballooned into 30 some thousand, 37,000 employees, and they have become a regulatory body within themselves. And uh, uh, we just don't need that in America. We need to be competitive. And, uh, you know, the reason I say these things is because, you know, over the years, and Bob, you've been here for as long, longer than I have, but, you know, we have never been able to debate these issues on the floor. When you talk about product liability reform, that is so badly needed in this country today, we never had the opportunity to discuss it on the floor of Congress. Uh, uh, medical malpractice, you know, which is badly needed in this country. Uh, tax relief, capital gains tax cuts, which would stimulate this economy. Uh, I could go on, you know, about abolishing and merging and consolidating uh, agencies and bureaus and departments. We've never been able to even discuss it on the floor of Congress. And now we have that opportunity. So maybe we are zealous, uh, Tony, in our, uh, in our efforts, and we're impatient, but it's because we've just been hung up so long and not been able to even debate these issues, and that's why sure. we support it. Mr. Walker. If I might speak to the, to the issue I think that Mr. Bielenson uh, rightly um, raises, uh, the, the, the difficulty that we have, I will say, in, in being involved in these discussions uh, is that the uh, Secretary of the Treasury has already announced that the bill that was brought forward from the Ways and Means Committee is going to be a candidate for, uh, uh, for a veto. Therefore, we have to assume uh, from our own perspective that this is, this is lifting that we are going to have to do on our own, that the President's party is probably not going to be in favor uh, of the bill brought out of the Ways and Means Committee. So therefore, we need to figure out a way to get this job done. As you've heard from some of my colleagues here earlier this evening, they're not very enthusiastic about voting to, to raise the debt limit. Uh, I'm personally not uh, terribly enthusiastic about that heavy lifting. Uh, but we have tried to find some things where both, where there has been bipartisan consensus in both the House and the Senate on, on some matters. Uh, and uh, in the case of regulatory reform, uh, we had literally a veto-proof bill that passed out of the House of Representatives uh, on, on that matter. The Senate um, uh, found 58 votes earlier in the year, uh, bipartisan in nature. Uh, and uh, this is a matter where we think uh, that it, it gives both the House and the Senate a reason for uh, uh, looking toward an extension of the debt limit and getting this job done. And so, uh, you know, I understand the point you're making, uh, but um, uh, in fact, uh, we need to find votes from those who are likely to supply votes. Reclaiming my time, if I may, for just a very Certainly. brief time, Mr. Chairman, may I say to my good friend and classmate from Pennsylvania, this is not the way to get the job done, if, John, done, if I may suggest it. I don't think you're going to attract the votes of Democrats who voted for regulatory relief uh, on this particular thing. I also would say parenthetically that the more you clean this up, the more Democratic votes you get. You know, I know you, apparently you guys don't like, you folks don't like to vote to raise the debt limit. I'm not sure whether we like to or not, but we I do never, it often I enough that it's, you know, it's no big deal for us, as you're well aware. And the, and the nicer you make this bill, <laughs> no, seriously, you can, you can save some of your folks the trauma of having to vote for raising the debt limit or extending the debt limit by making it attractive enough to some Democrats to do because, you know, we'll do it by the hundreds as we have in the, well, we don't have 200 anymore, but <laughs> if, we, if we did, we would. No, but in all serious, I just want to say one more word. <laughs> Whatever we've got, well, but no, just one more thing, seriously. Yes. Uh, we are, I'm not arguing, we're not, we're not speaking against these specific proposals, although I personally don't support them. 
That's not the point. We're speaking against, as you're well aware under, and understand, Mr. Chairman, against including them in this bill. Uh, we hope you don't do it, I'd say to our friends on the majority side, because this debt limit thing is a serious problem. We all are aware of that. We should play as few games as possible with it. You know, you have to play certain games because you want to be in a position where you, you know, have some leverage with the president. We, un we understand that. Um, all, all we're doing is appealing to you not to make it more difficult than, it, than necessary by mm -hmm. including truly extraneous stuff in here, even if it may be wonderful stuff. This isn't, but if it were, still be wrong to put it in right. and continue to pursue the regular legislative course to get this other, these other matters into law. Right. Well, Tony, I, I don't want to belabor this, but uh, your points well, are don't. well. Your points are well taken, and that uh, you know, if we were to uh, put out a clean CR, we would uh, we might pick up some Democrat votes. But uh, on the other hand, you're going to lose Jerry Solomon, who has never voted for a, for a de increase in the debt limit in my we'd life. Like to, we'd like to and keep I'm you finding pure. it very difficult to do that, and uh, we're they're going to have to make it Chairman. very very sweet for me to want to do it. I voted for a foreign aid bill today. I mean, this year for the first time in my life. And the only way they got me to vote for it is because they cut $2 billion out of it. It's amazing how so, responsible um, you get when you're it, in, in it really the majority. Is. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other questions? <laughs> the Mrs. Price. I'm sorry, Mr. Goss. I didn't see you come in. M Mrs. Price. I just want to clear up something that um, I, I think I heard someone say. You, and well, I'm not sure why you're sitting there together. That, and I like you both, too. And <laughs> I want to be <laughs> Mrs. Price, if you yield, they want to be self-executed jointly. <laughs> Come again. <laughs> I prefer my explanation. <laughs> well, you, you aren't um, considering combining your amendments. Is, is there? Okay. And, but you both want your amendments approved. Is that correct? Yes. Right. Made in order. And, and so is there any relationship between your amendments, I guess, no. is what I'm asking. I'm trying to get you over no, no, here. No. No, yeah, no, I think this was a time-saving device. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Debbie, I'm You're sorry. I don't think you were here, but I asked them both to come forward so that we could ask them both questions and it would save going a complete round, which would put us here after Fine. midnight. Again. All right. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. I missed that. Thank I'm you, sorry, gentlemen. That's all I wanted to know. Are there further questions? Mr. Frost of Texas. Well, Mr. Chairman, and, and particularly uh, to my friend, Mr. Walker, whom uh, I often disagree with, but for whom I have a, uh, a real affection because of uh, the seriousness in which he, at which he approaches matters. Uh, Bob, I seem to recall when we were in the majority and you were in the minority that you were one of the members who, who protested most loudly uh, about Christmas tree bills, about taking a, a simple piece of legislation and adding all kinds of extraneous amendments and to close it. Rule. And uh, I would, would ask uh, why your, your sentiment has changed uh, about putting extraneous matters onto uh, straightforward legislation. Well, I think I made an explanation here that uh, in this particular case, we think the responsible thing to do is to, uh, uh, is to move a debt limit uh, out of here. But uh, in all honesty, uh, we are not getting any uh, cooperation from the White House or from the uh, from the Treasury Department or from uh, uh, the President's party on, on Capitol Hill. And so, therefore, we are trying to find ways that we think uh, we can uh, uh, do what we think is an important uh, uh, item uh, to get accomplished. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I take seriously the, uh, the responsibility of governing. Uh, you know, I, I found that, that being in the majority and actually having the responsibility of governing does give you a different perspective on, on some of these things. I was asked by somebody right after I had uh, chaired my first markup uh, why it was uh, that uh, I did, wasn't pounding the table and shouting so much in committee anymore. And I said, well, there's a certain serenity that comes in knowing you have the votes. Uh, and um, uh, the, the fact is that, um, uh, that uh, you know, I'm here because I believe this is something uh, that, um, that we in the majority have to get done. Well, Bob, uh, as, as, a, as someone who uh, has voted consistently for debt limit extensions, uh, I'm a member who has, I suspect, I haven't carefully reviewed my record, but I suspect that I have voted for every single debt limit extension uh, during the time that I've been in Congress. And I find the, the argument that somehow you've got to buy votes on the majority side with extraneous provisions because you can't otherwise get votes for a debt limit extension, I find that to be a very peculiar argument. Uh, first of well, all, it's, it's something it's something that was done on several occasions during the 1980s uh, when when the debt limit was used as a way of uh, of trying to uh, muscle the Reagan administration. I mean, it, it, it's not it's not unusual for uh, for this pattern to develop. But I think there were in one year there were six occasions uh, when uh, short-term debt extensions uh, were passed 
uh, uh, kind of back-to-back -back while negotiations uh, were underway uh, to try to muscle the, the, the White House. But that's correct. Actually, it was in 1990, but there weren't any extraneous matters added to them. They were simply straight, short-term extensions. And that's really, it seems to me, that's the, the simplest and most direct and most honest way to approach this is if, if you want to keep this on a short string to put pressure on the president, well, then keep it on a short string with a straight extension rather than add, making this into a Christmas tree and then justifying the Christmas tree by saying that's the only way I could get, you could get people in the majority to vote for a debt extension. It's, it's very peculiar. That's all I, I can well, say. Well, I just, I disagree with your, with your characterization. Of course, I, you know, I really believe that uh, uh, we're developing here a very responsible piece of legislation that is speaking to uh, broad-based needs of the American people. Uh, and um, uh, there we can, in fact, uh, accomplish a number of good things at the same time. Well, let me pursue one of those, if I may. Um, uh, you may recall I voted for the regulatory reform legislation earlier this year. And why, why can't that be accomplished through the normal legislative process? What happened? What, uh, how did that fall off the track? Uh, in large part, there was a filibuster uh, in, in the Senate uh, on, uh, on these matters, and um, uh, so that the majority will of the Senate uh, was not uh, ultimately reflected uh, because uh, of, a, of a filibuster. And, uh, you know, it, it's one of these cases where uh, we are attempting to uh, uh, try to uh, uh, have uh, the, the majority will of the Senate and the House prevail on these matters. Yeah, it's very interesting because we, we went over this ground last night in another context, and, and we... We seem to be, uh, it's, it, members of the majority party in the House uh, seem to be saying many of the same things about the United States Senate that uh, we said when we were in the majority. Uh, I guess some well, things well, just, that? I guess things just never change. Uh, the, um, uh, it, it, is a, it is peculiar, though, that um, we would feel the need to um, entice people to vote for a debt ceiling increase by providing them with uh, pieces of of legislation that uh, should, should in fact, in the past, normally would go through the normal legislative process, and in which, when you were in the major in the minority, you strenuously objected when we tried to do things well, like I, this. I, I would simply say that uh, there were obviously a number of people on your side who uh, who felt that uh, raising the debt in order to cover the spending that was being done uh, was uh, was was an appropriate thing to do. Uh, there are a number of people on our side who feel that uh, the spending was uh, was done. Uh, uh, without uh, their assent in the past, and uh, in this particular case, uh, uh, they uh, would prefer to know that we are taking steps toward ending uh, some of those spending practices uh, as, as a part of, of raising this debt ceiling. And I, I just think uh, that, that's, that that's where the issue gets joined, and, it, and it's the right kind of approach to be well, taking at this point. Well, Bob, I guess I'm just kind of old-fashioned and that I believe in paying my bills, and that uh, uh, the, we can fight out the issue about whether certain uh, programs uh, should be passed uh, or, sh or whether certain programs should be repealed. But once uh, debt is incurred, uh, just as I do in my own personal life, if I have incurred a debt, I pay it. Uh, even though I may think the price was too high, or maybe it was an item that I didn't really need after all, but if I've incurred the debt, I pay that debt. Well, and uh, the, we are trying to take the steps here to assure that, uh, that we can, in fact, uh, pay the debt, and uh, that's, that's exactly uh, what we're doing. Uh, and uh, the fact is uh, we, we're trying to take the right step here to, uh, to assure that uh, this uh, a particular uh, matter is uh, responsibly uh, addressed. Well, I don't want to belabor it anymore. I, I just find it very strange that the majority has to buy the votes of its own members in order to pass, uh, pass its own bill. I, the gentleman I, mean, I find on that, that to be very peculiar. The gentleman yield on I, that I, point. I don't think that's a characterization of buying anybody's vote. But the gentleman, I, I think, has badly mischaracterized that. Uh, the gentleman it keeps using the word extraneous. I think that the cost of misguided regulation is very, very high and a big part of the reason why we can never seem to get to a balanced budget. I congratulate these gentlemen for bringing forward ways that help us get to that glide path and keep us there. Uh, I would agree there are a number of vehicles that could be made available to do that. This is one of them. There are other vehicles as well. Uh, that I could think of, as well, I'm sure the gentleman could from re Texas. Reclaim my time. Uh, the point I was trying to make it make is that we never did that when we were in the majority. We never tried to graft onto the debt limit extension uh, matters that uh, we couldn't otherwise pass because we couldn't get along with the would Senate. Would the gentleman the further yield? Sure. But, but, but I would say that to the gentleman that you did not have uh, the size of national debt to deal with. 
uh, we have inherited from you after uh, four decades a giant debt to deal with. We're that. serious no, about we, we, There's no point in replaying who shot John. We did that, some of that last night. Uh, but quite frankly, uh, um, we've been, we were accused of a lot of things when we were in the majority, when we were in the majority. But I just want to make the point that I've made to Mr. Dreyer on, re, on numerous occasions this year, that you all have been, now that you're in the majority, you have been even more creative in the use of the House rules and accomplishing indirectly various objectives than we ever considered doing when we were in the majority. The gentleman yield. The uh, gentleman yield yes. to me for a moment. <laughs> uh, and, and I'd like to point out, the yield to me, Mr. Chairman, just yeah, for a no, moment, yes. if I may, uh, Trying to be that on 80 or 85 percent of the occasions when the great majority of Democrats did vote to raise the debt, debt limit, it was at the request of a Republican president whom we were happy to help because we thought we had to, we thought it was a responsible thing to do, and we did not try to force down those presidents' throats. At this point, uh, the fact that, that we are being more than, uh, than fiscally responsible. And let me assure you that uh, all of the debt holders, uh, most of whom happen to be overseas, uh, the country of the Netherlands is the largest uh, holder of, the, uh, of this $4.9 trillion debt, I think followed by Great Britain and a few other countries. But nevertheless, the interest on this $4.9 trillion debt, the annual interest to pay, can't hear guys, uh, the interest this year is about $250 billion. Now, in the budget, that President Clinton said up to us last year, he called for an increase over the next five years of another trillion dollars. What do you think that does to the annual debt service that is $250 billion today? It brings it up to almost $350 billion. And again, as I've said before, God forbid, if inflation sets back in and inflation goes up to what it was under Jimmy Carter, 9, 10, 11, 12, it even hit 13 percent. Do you know what that $350 billion annual debt service would be? $700 billion, and where would you get the money to pay off that debt then, that annual debt to the, to the debt holders? You wouldn't. You'd have to strip every single uh, recipient program in America to even pay for it. So this is being more than fiscally responsible by getting this debt under control. Mr. Walker, Mr. and then we have to move yeah, on. Mr. Chairman, I, I would just uh, point out also that at least we are taking the step of facing up and actually dealing with this issue straight on as, as an issue. Right. The fact is that what happened in the latter years uh, uh, here uh, before we took over was that the uh, debt limit increase was put on automatic pilot under the Gebhardt rule. Uh, and in fact uh, was not voted on uh, at all. We never really faced up to the issue. We just kind of let it accumulate uh, without ever facing up to the issue. At least what we're doing here is facing up to the issue. Uh, I think we left off with Mr. diaz Ballart. Uh, would you care to be recognized, sir? No, sir. I have no questions. Mrs. Waldholz? Uh, Mr. McGinnis just came back in. Mr. McGinnis? If not, as, uh, Mr. Dreyer. If I could just make one very brief statement on this issue of uh, regulation following on what Porter had raised, and that is, uh, as well as looking at just the cost itself of regulation and how it's going to put us uh, on the road towards balanced budget by proceeding with your amendment here, it seems to me that, especially if you look at an area I represent in Southern California where we have serious economic problems, reducing that regulatory burden is clearly going to play a role in increasing the kind of economic opportunity that doesn't exist today because so much of the regulation has slowed down job creation and the kinds of incentives that need to be put into place to, uh, to see the uh, economic growth which we hope for. And that's why I think your amendment is a very good and important one. Are there further questions of the uh, panel? If not, gentlemen, we uh, really appreciate the hard work you've done, and thank you for coming before us again. Thank you. Uh, the next witness uh, to appear before us this evening is Mr. George uh, Geekus, uh, better known as the, the uh, defender against uh, crime in, uh, in the state of Pennsylvania. And, uh, thank you. And uh, let me tell you, uh, Mr. Geekus was mugged on his own front porch the other night, and when the uh, muggers made off with the keys to his rented car, he chased them down the street. Uh, if it was my rented car, I would have let him take it, Gus. Uh, yeah. They tell me the car was so bad they were ready to bring it back anyway. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> I, I Mr. Thank Gigas, if you would uh, feel free to yes. summarize your entire statement, we'll I appear thank in the, the chair. Record. I must Without start objection. off by saying I was extremely disappointed. I know you've heard me dozens of times yes. on a recurring theme. I was very disappointed that the rules committee did not even consider my proposition last evening in 
in confluence with the uh, continuing resolution. Very disappointed that you didn't consider it. Laugh it off, vote on it, and, 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 and call me an idiot, but do it. Please consider the proposition. I make it seriously, and I, I mean every word I present to this committee. This is not a nonsensical proposition I'm making to this committee or to the Congress. In the context of what we're discussing here this evening, I'm asking for a self-executed rule for the this instant replay on continuing resolutions. What would happen if you did adopt my self-executing proposition and put it into the debt limit proposition that's in front of you? We would come up to December the 1st, which is the end line, is it not, for the continuing resolution, is it? Is that, is that That's the case correct. I yield to John? That's correct. If my proposition prevails and no agreement is reached before December the 1st, then there's an instant replay under my proposition of the current, the one uh, continuing resolution that has taken us up to December the 1st. What do we gain by that? We gain the lowest possible funding stream, which is what the Republicans propose and want to see occur. We have for the Democrats then no, no end to, no train wreck. And also the, the increased capacity for the president to negotiate for the uh, resuscitation of programs that the Republicans want to zero out, shall we say. So the negotiation process is fostered, not diminished, if you adopt it. Then the debt limit thing, when it recurs on December the 12th, is a problem all its own, but we don't have to worry then about the CRs. The chairman himself said, I don't care how many CRs we adopt between now and Christmas and New Year's, three, four, that's what the gentleman said, the gentleman from New York said. I'm giving you that opportunity. You're saying the debt limit is the important feature that we have to deal with after December 12th. No matter how many CRs there are, and you'll vote for every one of them, you just vote for one, the geekish proposal, and they'll all be self-executing, to reuse that phrase, only under the wordings of my instant replay uh, proposition. Now, the gentleman from Florida, on the floor yesterday, and, and some of you in other contexts before, have applauded the, or at least you've uh, acquiescedly uh, commended the legislation that I've offered, have said that the time has come for them. But not this year. If not now, when? When do we have such monumental problems with CRs except now? And next year it'll be now. And next the following year it'll be now. Every September the 30th we face this same issue and we can cure it if you pass this as a self-executing rule tonight as part of your debt limit uh, practice. Very disappointed that you did not accord me at least a, a vote on my proposition last night. Do not laugh it off. I, um, I believe it is in the highest um, traditions of trying to do something about the budget impasse that we face every single year. And it has received a whole cordon of uh, endorsements uh, of, from different organizations across the, the country, in, inside and outside the Beltway. So I'm not just a Don Quixote here, although uh, sometimes I feel that that's so. I would strongly urge that the, uh, the committee take up the rule, laugh at me afterwards, but vote on the rule, vote on my proposition, and be men and women about adopt it. I think I've said what I wanted to say. I feel better. Not yet. Not mm -hmm. yet. Well, George, let me make you feel better. <coughs> you know, you shouldn't say that, uh, that we laugh at you, because no, you, no, you are saying... one of the most respected members of this body, and uh, you know that. Uh, uh, especially from me and from other members. So uh, uh, I just want you to know that your amendment was discussed. It was discussed in a Republican leadership meeting. It was discussed in a separate meeting with the Speaker and other people. Uh, and it was given consideration. Whether there is a vote on it or not uh, uh, really is irrelevant. Uh, uh, we aren't going to introduce your amendment and then vote it against it. That's, uh, that's not the way we do things here. And, uh, but uh, certainly your amendment does have uh, merit. The, uh, the, uh, the whole
whole philosophy of it, and uh, and one of these days it probably is going to be worked into to the well, to the I'd regular like to, procedure. I'd like but to it's yield to you or to any of the members to tell me why it's good next year and not now. Nobody said it was good next year or oh, yes. good last year. No, who said that? I it, think that has been said. I say it. <laughs> well, uh, I just think that there's a lot of merit to your amendment, and uh, uh, if we did not have the other issues at stake. Uh, uh, we would certainly consider it, and uh, and it was considered uh, by all of us let earlier me, on. Let me ask you, uh, yeah. Mr. Chairman, if, yeah. I, if I can sure. yield to you, so you can yield to me, so we can yield. To I each would other. yield to you, my good friend. What, what, what is the opposition to it? The opposition is that we have other issues that we want to add to it today because we have already had a continuing resolution that is clean cut, the same way that yours is, but not continuing beyond a certain date, and. We did not make any progress, and now we feel that uh, that we have to make that progress. In other words, we had to make it with a continuing resolution, and we have to make it on this debt ceiling. If we don't, we're going to lose out. And I mentioned before that every month that goes by, now that we are past the beginning of the of the federal government's fiscal year, which was October 1st, it makes it that much more difficult for us to catch up. When you lose $100 billion in saving in the month of October, you can't pick it up in November. It's, it's twice as hard then. But Mr. Chairman, I'm saying if you adopt my proposition, you still have the same ability to deal with the debt limit on December the 12th. In fact, the necessity of it, not just the ability mm -hmm. or the, the uh, uh, non-necessity of it, it's there. You're going to have to deal with it. In the meantime, our fiscal house is in order because the continuing resolution replays itself and there is no s shutdown of government because of lack of continuing resolution. That's all mm -hmm. uh, simple, simple mm -hmm. proposition. Well, George, your points are well taken. Are there any questions to my left uh, of the witness? Mr. Chairman, I would like to respond very briefly. Mr. Goss. I have uh, considered Mr. Geeks's proposal. We've heard it many times before. I think it has great merit, and we have included it in our budget reform process. In fact, I spoke to your uh, proposal today under the Barton uh, Stanholm uh, package that was brought out this morning, Barton Stenholm Cox, I guess it's called now. I mentioned it on the floor. Uh, and I think it has merit. I do not think that this is the year to use it for a very simple reason. I think we lose bargaining power right now, and I think we lose incentive in what is a very difficult and unique time. I believe, however, when we get a new budget process, it is an important tool to bring into play, because at that point we bring the president, if we do the budget process that's being talked about, into the budget game at the beginning rather than at the end, and the idea of your automatic pilot continuing resolution works very well to protect the people and the country, but it also does not get involved with the question of incentive to get the president to would, come would the, and deal. Would the gentleman yield? Of for, course. For, isn't it true that more incentive and more pressure applies to the president if the Republican majority wants to apply pressure to the president? I do. I join in that. On the question of the debt limit raising than it does on the continuing resolution. You do not abandon the pressure point that you want to apply to the president by adopting my continuing resolution process because the debt limit comes to an end December the 12th, does it not? And if the president would dare not to accede in negotiations to a final package, then that pressure point remains for him to act. In the meantime, the uh, continuing resolution provides for the steady stream of funding that we're talking about. Uh, opposite that. Well, I have not been in negotiation with the president clearly, but those who have say that we have not done well and we need all the pressure points possible. That I, would be my answer for tonight. Are there uh, questions to the uh, to the right, Mr. Hall of uh, just Ohio? A, just a statement, Mr. Chairman. I I think uh, Mr. Geekus probably has the best idea of the night, maybe the best idea of the year. I firmly believe in what he's trying to do. I wish we would have done this a couple of years ago. Every every year that we face these kinds of problems, we go back home. Our people always ask us, "Why do you people do this?" Why can't you settle this in a very simple way? This is a very simple, very logical, very practical idea. I will offer Mr. Geekus' amendment to this debt limit bill, and uh, we'll see. And there will be a vote, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Bielenson, and then we must move yes. on. Yes, you know, just very briefly, I just, I just wanted to echo what my friend Mr. Hall from Ohio said. Uh, we do think it's a useful proposal. We do wish it were already in the law, and I would say to our 
friend from Pennsylvania, you sound almost as naive as I often do. Has it never occurred to you, has it not occurred to you, George, that it may be that some of the colleagues of yours and your own party uh, don't exactly want the fiscal house to be in order at the moment, do perhaps want to break down. Well, and that's perhaps I, I why... I take exceptions to that. Well, I know you do, but I'm suggesting to you that uh, what you have is a proposal that would, that would keep things going, and it may be that some folks don't want things to, to go along smoothly at the moment, believing, as they perhaps properly do, that they, they, they need some... Uh, they need some kind of a breakdown here in order to give them the leverage that they think they need to deal with the president. No, I just believe that no. they don't see it as clearly as I do. That's that may right. be. <laughs> well, if, uh, if we might, uh, gentlemen, George, we really appreciate you Thanks coming before much, us. Thank uh, you again. Thank you. The next uh, scheduled witness is, uh, I believe, Mr. Uh, Dana Rohrbacher of California. Dana, if you would feel free to summarize your entire statement, will appear in the record without objection. And it's, it's a short statement anyway. All right, sir. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. And uh, first of all, I'd like to compliment Mr. Mowgli on his fine beard that uh, I think adds greatly to uh, your looks. And, I've been and trying to get him to shave it off. <laughs> I found out that anything that covers any part of my face is an improvement. Uh, I heard that, too, and that's... Uh, <laughs> Well, uh, today I'm trying to uh, solve a major problem that continues to occur as we consider the dismantling of the Commerce Department. Um, and in the uh, Chrysler Amendment is a provision not necessary for the dismantling of the department. It was originally inserted into the bill, apparently, to avoid the normal legislative process, process which may have resulted in its defeat. The provision I am referring to is the section which turns the Patent and Trademark Office into a government corporation similar to the U.S. Post Office. Uh, this provision could have serious ramifications for American competitiveness by entirely restructuring the agency that is responsible for protecting American inventions. Uh, it largely removes a core federal function from the executive branch and congressional scrutiny. Of course, with the Patent Office's uh, parent department being dismantled, uh, there has to be some uh, disposition of the Patent Office. And as I stated when I appeared before this committee on the reconciliation bill, I personally think the best and ultimate solution would be to merge it with the Copyright Office at the Library of Congress. But until the subject can be thought through and properly dealt with, all it needs to be done, all that needs to be done for right now is to make it an independent agency. And this is what I propose in the amendment that you have before you that was drafted to replace the corresponding provision in the reconciliation bill, which should now be uh, part of the Chrysler bill. Sometimes in the future, uh, and when basically when we go through the normal legislative process, we can deal with what the patent office is supposed to look like. And by the way, I made them support what is being uh, offered. It may well be the best thing to do in terms of reform that we do make the patent office in kind of an independent agency like the post office. But I don't know that now, and I don't think anybody else does as well. We need to thoroughly look at this. The patent office is so important for the American, uh, America's leverage and world trade, et cetera. We don't know making them totally independent of uh, uh, operation or, or semi-independent uh, federal corporation whether that's going to make things better or worse, whether it's going to mean that our, our, our inventors are protected against people trying to steal their patents overseas and domestic, we need to look at it, and that's all I'm saying. Mr. Chairman, I feel strongly that changes of this magnitude, which are not necessary to dismantle the Department of Commerce, should not be dealt with in this bill. And I ask this committee to remove this controversial item uh, from the Chrysler Amendment, and thank you very much. <laughs> well, Dana, I appreciate your coming before us. Uh, the, the, I, I've just come across, I understand that we just received this about a half hour ago. It's, a, right. it's a 260 lines. Uh, and what does it, uh, was, does it do anything beyond what you've just stated? Well, what we're talking about is a major change in, in, in something that is in the Constitution of the United States. I mean, a patent office was put by the authors of our Constitution into the Constitution as a core federal function. Now, we, want to, we may want to try to privatize things as much as we can here, but this would be the equivalent of saying, well, we want to, we want to as free marketeers and conservatives, we want to encourage private arbitration, 
So what we're going to do is we're going to take all the federal judges and make them part of a semi-independent federal corporation of judges. Well, my gosh, that's, you know, mm. judicial, the judicial function of the government is an important part of it. We better darn well consider that before we start making those type of changes. And in an age of technology, in an age when technology gives us the leverage we need to beat the foreign competition, we better not make this kind of change without looking at it first. Now, again, I may support it uh, a year from now or six months from now. But at this time, I'm just saying caution. If we're going to dismantle the Department of Commerce, we can do it. Uh, basically with this other approach by making an independent agency without uh, changing the structure itself. I see. Uh, Dean, I, I noticed that the, uh, the amendment uh, was drafted uh, as an amendment uh, in the nature of a substitute to the uh, uh, to Kasich of Ohio, which was the reconciliation bill. Right. Was this considered by, by them or by the Commerce Committee and their reconciliation package? Was there any vote on it? Uh, uh, I don't think there was. I'm not sure. You're not sure about it? I'm okay. not sure. It wasn't in your committee. It was uh, not in my committee. Okay. okay. Uh, any questions of the witness? Mr. Dreyer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I congratulate you on your very hard work on this issue, Dana. You've been working on it for a long period of time. The only question that I would raise is that uh, we have before us a package, the Department of Commerce Dismantling Act, and uh, it goes through this litany of items. You are looking at one particular area, that obviously being the right. Patent Office, and it seems to me that uh, uh, they've spent a lot of time on this. Did you work at all with the members of this task force that Mr. Chrysler chaired and others looking at the trade operation within the Department of Commerce and other areas? And no, I did not. Okay. I mean, I, frankly, it, this no, came to my attention, but as we all have been so oh, overwhelmed absolutely. with this, we have. what's been going on, it, it might have crossed, it, maybe it should have crossed my attention, and what, we were too busy, but I don't believe so. Yeah, I'm just saying that that, I mean, that creates, I mean, what, what we've had is we've had this task force that over the past several months has been meeting, uh, looking at the issue of dismantling the Department of Commerce, and uh, they've come forward with a package, it's been offered several times, and that just this would makes not, it kind I'm of not tough. advocating that we, that that we pull back from dismantling. No, 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 no. I understand that. But they have their outline of uh, eight or nine proposals that look at dismantling the department. And I just think that, that to, you know, at, at this at this late hour, look at this, it makes it a little difficult for us. I hope you can understand that. Well, I understand it's a little difficult, but it's a little difficult for everybody, every other member down there to be just presented a fait accompli when, when these things well, are really but very I mean, important. I mean, I mean it's, it's all, very important. The only point that I'd make it is, shouldn't be all yes, we've all, yes, we've all been very busy, but this task force has had a wide range of members, a lot of freshman members, a lot of more senior members. Uh, I know that Mr. Klinger was heavily involved in this, Mr. Uh, Walker was heavily involved in this, and uh, I, I remember when they unveiled their, their package uh, about uh, a month or so ago, and this is something that I, were I just know that, and, and you said every other member down there, but the only thing I so would... Were there hearings, were there hearings on, the, uh, on this patent proposal? Well, I know that they, they had hearings on the whole issue of the Department of Commerce, whether mm -hmm. someone was there to raise the question that you obviously would have about the patent office I don't know if that question was raised obviously I wasn't there but I mean I think that that we need to look at the fact that there was a broad cross-section of our membership involved in putting this package together and my, just, my guess is that's the case that if we permit this to come to the floor as, as an amendment or if we uh, if we strike it out I, I think that it just gives all of us that much more time to look at it but then well why not give me a chance to bring it to the floor as an amendment to, to do this that's another alternative but I think that just giving us see I don't have any any complaints for the rest of, of this we uh, in fact dismantling Department of Commerce is fine with me sure. I just don't want to have to turn around and see that a core function of government this, this may be something that may be very detrimental, and I haven't had a chance to look at it. I don't think many people else have had a chance to look at it. It's just that this is coming up tomorrow, and, you know, we're approaching the middle of the night right now, and it's just this kind of the last hour. I would just say to the gentleman that we've had uh, dozens, literally dozens of proposals similar to this, uh, and when we have gotten them in due time, uh, uh, Mac Collins uh, of Georgia had a serious problem in the Medicare, and we we met uh, earlier with the committees of jurisdiction to try to work it out. 
and uh, I just hope we can take care of you, Dana, but it's, a, it's, it's very difficult having received it at this late hour without being able to communicate with, uh, uh, with Tom Bliley, the chairman, and, uh, and the other people yeah, uh, involved. I, I did bring this up several weeks ago, by the way. Yeah. This, was, this is not new. I mean, I brought this up, and Mr. Goss was chairing the hearing at right. the time. I think it was two weeks ago. On the reconciliation. And the reconciliation, right. and there was some time to talk about it. And uh, uh, since that time, I certainly haven't had people making overtures to me and saying, yeah. wait a minute, you know, let's talk about this and such. Would gentleman yield on that point? Mr. Goss. One of the things that that I did ask at the time, Dan, and I, I, because I happen to think you make an awful lot of sense, you obviously have a lot more expertise That's on this than I do, uh, was that you go to the, the people involved uh, in the various committees. And has any of that transpired since that, that time you last appeared here? Yeah, this came out of Mr. Moorhead's subcommittee, and frankly, Mr. Moorhead and I have some fundamental differences about uh, the importance of uh, uh, maintaining uh, the patent law. Well, I must say, when I got this, the, the, the statement here that says, the, 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 I don't know if you got this sheet or not, but it's the sheet we're working off of, the summary of what we're doing with the Department of Commerce and, and the provisions made for the various elements of it corporatizes the patent and trademark office, established a fee-funded, wholly-owned government corporation, which is what you're talking about. And uh, you don't agree with that approach, and uh, obviously... I may agree with it later on, but uh, frankly, even later on, my, my guesstimate right now <laughs> is that I'm going to have some very serious uh, reservations, and I think that most of us will have very serious reservations, of putting a core function of the government that makes judicial decisions. We're making a decision as to whether someone owns title to a piece of technology that could change America and change the world, and we're going to put that in the hands of somebody now in, like, the post office, where we do not have as much leverage on these people to make sure they're, they're doing what's fair and right. That doesn't make any sense to me. Right. Well, my, the only reason I ask is because it seemed to me, I mean, this is the kind of wisdom that we don't have, I think, on this committee. Maybe other members do. I don't. But I, in good faith, ask you to take it back to the committee people that have the responsibility, the authorization, uh, and appropriations uh, areas of uh, interest on this, and because uh, that's where it's going to have to, we're going to have to get our signal from. Well, Dana, Dana, one one way or the other, uh, I, I can, I feel I could almost assure you that before. Uh, this department is abolished. Before we get through with the conferences, uh, in my own opinion, your position is going to prevail. And I'll certainly do everything I can to help you. Okay. Well, thank you very we, much. We really appreciate your coming before us. Thank you very, very much. The, uh, uh, the were there any questions on this side? I didn't think so. They had indicated thank you very it. Much. Thank you very much. The uh, next scheduled witness is uh, the Honorable Nick Smith of Michigan. He has waited patiently, and uh, he is one of the most uh, diligent members of this uh, this entire Congress. And uh, oh God, you're right. And I appreciate his uh, his being a pit bull and sticking to uh, to his position. Uh, Mr. Nick, Chairman, it's always members, great to have you're, here. you're the patient patient ones. <laughs> uh, I have uh, uh, three amendments. Mr. Bielens and I consider them uh, all connected uh, with the importance of managing the cash flow of the government. Uh, I was here before this committee early this spring when I asked to, that we suggested that we should get rid of Rule 41 of the House, which is the Gebhard Rule. You complied with that, so now we are voting on increases in the debt ceiling separately. Uh, I'm concerned about where we are in overspending as you are, but it's more than the $4.9 trillion. We have a, a unfunded liability or an actuary debt in Social Security of another $3.5 trillion, Medicare of another $5 trillion, unfunded, li unfunded uh, pension fund obligations of another half trillion. What do we do to get to a balanced budget? I'm suggesting, Mr. Chairman, that we put language in this bill uh, that, that increases the chances that we're going to reach a balanced budget by the fiscal year 2002. Earlier, uh, earlier in the year, in March, uh, Chris Shays and I started an effort of sending, of signing a, a letter, sending it to the president, sending it to Bob Dole, sending it to Newt Gingrich. 158 of us signed that letter saying we're not going to vote for an increase in the debt ceiling unless we're on the glide path to a balanced budget. Uh, the language you've got in this bill now is, is an intent of Congress. This language says that we will not issue additional marketable debt after the, the uh, after uh, uh, we, uh, uh, after September 31st of, of 2001. In other words, it simply says we're going to stop borrowing money other than borrowing that money from the trust funds. 
Uh, it says we're going to balance the budget by the year 2002. I think it's important for many of us that signed that letter uh, that we have some indication that we can achieve the balanced budget. Uh, I have read and appreciate the uh, language, uh, Mr. Chairman, that you read earlier, and it seemed important to many of us that we expand on that language, uh, and this amendment does exactly that. Now, shall I, should I cover the other two amendments very quickly? If, if you would, Nick, um, you'd uh, be heard on them. Mr. Chairman, uh, I suggested, as, as you know, <coughs> I've been uh, uh, studying the, the debt ceiling and the consequences for the last six months. I suggested to Mr. Archer that we include in this temporary debt ceiling increase language that would prohibit disinvestment. He told me that he was going to include that language. That language was included. But I think there's a problem that that language needs to be reconsidered. I have an amendment before you uh, that simply that says that if there is disinvestment or underinvestment, if there's disinvestment or underinvestment, there will not be any additional issuing of marketable securities. Now, here's what might happen. Uh, there's a chance that the president might veto this temporary increase there's a chance that the president might veto uh, the reconciliation bill. But if you were president, what would you do uh, if you were very, uh, if you uh, felt committed to veto maybe the reconciliation bill, and here was a bill coming towards you that said after you sign it, you can't disinvest. I think one alternative possibly is disinvesting before you get the bill. This language says that if there's disinvestment, you can't borrow additional money from the public, marketable securities, until that disinvestment is settled. And I sus uh, the, uh, if there's any questions on that, I, I would respond to them. But I, I truly think that you need to spend a couple minutes considering that possibility. Again, in the language of the bill that came out of the uh, Ways and Means Committee, it says you cannot have additional disinvestment. Uh, and so, uh, uh, number one, you can underinvest the so-called G funds, the thrift funds. Right now, there's $20.3 billion in what's called the thrift fund, the 401k funds. That's invested daily, every morning. Uh, and so that $20 billion is going to be available uh, to Treasury. Uh, if you look at what's happened in past mis administrations, there's been disinvestment of both Social Security funds and the federal pension funds. Right now there's $340 billion in the pension funds that would last the president for a year if he'd made that decision to disinvest it. Uh, are there any questions on that one? Or the last no, one, go the last ahead. one very briefly, right. is, is simply giving uh, what we talked about last night, giving authority to the president to prioritize spending uh, uh, in the event that there's a cash flow problem because the debt ceiling has been increased. And so, so the, should the executive officer of the United States government have the, the authority to prioritize spending, which should it simply be a first in, first out, or should Congress prioritize? Uh, I'm suggesting that Congress authorize these, any, expend, uh, any expenditures, and the uh, uh, executive officer of the United States should have the authority to prioritize so that we don't, uh, so that we don't uh, pay, uh, fund, pay money to individuals that can be easily put off and, and uh, not have the money available for important issues. Well, Nick, again, uh, <clears throat> I appreciate your, your expertise. It's enlightened a lot of us uh, on this issue. Uh, when we discussed all three of your amendments with Mr. Archer and other members of the Ways and Means Committee, uh, they, they went through the, the uh, text of the, exist of the uh, uh, legislation before us. And even though yours are strengthening uh, points, particularly the one that, uh, uh, that uh, amends Section 5, where it's a limitation on issuance of public debt obligations after September 30th, 2001, that one in particular is, is similar to mine but has more strength in it. But um, we just could not get Mr. Archer and uh, his people to agree to uh, to open up the uh, that portion of the Ways and Means budget and uh, of the bill, and uh, we still are attempting to to change their mind, 
and uh, we might do that before the night's over. But uh, yeah, it's, we, it's, we will do everything we can to help you. Mr. Chairman, it's, it's a very big vote for many of us. I know uh, it is. And if, and, if, and if the language doesn't lead us to, to a uh, ultimate balanced budget, with the, which this language does, right. it says uh, by the year 2002 we're going to stop uh, issuing additional marketable uh, debt. Right. Uh, uh, it's, it just gives a lot of us uh, a great deal of problems, and I think it's reasonable. We're after a balanced budget. Let's include, include the languages in this temporary increase. Well, Nick, your points are, are so well taken, and we really appreciate your coming. Gentlemen, Thank ladies. you again. And the uh, next witness is uh, Mr. Stockman of Texas, and uh, it's always a pleasure to welcome you here, sir. Thank you for having me today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee. Uh, I come before you to request... Uh, uh, to consider my amendment. I wouldn't be before you if it wasn't for a rule called the Bird Rule. We found out 6.30 last night. After it went through uh, all the uh, machinations of this Congress, we, we sent it through the Banking Committee. It passed through the Banking Committee. Uh, it also uh, made it into the Reconciliation Bill. And what the amendment is, which 49 states have, is uh, to allow uh, the t state of Texas to decide whether or not we can have second mortgages. Uh, my uh, brother uh, has adopted an African-American and also a Korean and he was trying to uh, adopt a Chinese child and he uh, went to the bank to find out if he could take a second mortgage out on his uh, home and in Texas he was told he couldn't do that even for something as innocent uh, as adopting a child and uh, until uh, actually, until yesterday in Texas, we could even uh, take out a second mortgage to pay off a, a federal tax lien. We, had, we were forced to sell our property, and yesterday it passed the state constitution. Uh, well, the, the history of this is that it occurred, uh, the Fifth Circuit ruled that, uh, that we could indeed take out second mortgages without violating the uh, Texas constitution. And then uh, Hen uh, Mr. Uh, Gonzalez from Texas offered an amendment last year and uh, superseded the uh, Fifth Circuit. Uh, my amendment simply uh, throws it back into the state of Texas. They have 19, to 1998 if they don't like the amendment to overrule it. I think it's ra rational, it's reasonable. It's supported uh, uh, I, by uh, Senator Graham uh, and Kay Bailey Hutchinson. Uh, it's also supported by a, a lot of the majority uh, uh, in our state uh, in terms of the congressmen that are from the majority side. So I ask you that you would consider this. I think it's reasonable. I wouldn't be before you if it had not been for the bird rule. It is revenue, revenue neutral, and that's right. why it was kicked out. But it would create 190,000 jobs. That's not according to Steve Stock, and that's not according to anyone but uh, the, the great uh, University of Texas A&M. Uh, an independent uh, body who said that would unleash uh, 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 economic boom in Texas. So for the 190,000 new jobs in Texas, I would ask that you would consider it as a self-executing uh, amendment. <laughs> well, Steve, um, I, for one, have a great deal of sympathy for you. There are a lot of uh, New York banks that would like to offer alternative you know, loans uh, in the state of Texas uh, that have branches there as well. And uh, I've been trying to, to work it out uh, with the Ways and Means Committee so that we could get this, uh, get this legislation uh, approved for you. We still are, have not heard back, and we're attempting to do that. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to. But if we don't, uh, again, we'd like to pursue it. Uh, I've spoken to uh, Senator DeMata, who is uh, the chairman of the Banking Committee, as you know, and the other body. And hopefully we'll be able to, if we aren't able to do it here, and I'm not saying we can't, because we still might. Uh, we're going to, we'll try to assist you in the, uh, in the conference. But again, I appreciate you having the patience to sit Thank here you. all night and listen to uh, all of the other people. I, uh, no doubt you've been enlightened and learned a lot like we have. I was told to be here at 8 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> it's right, and it's 10.20 uh, now. Uh, Steve, thank you again. Thank we really you. appreciate your coming. Thank you very much. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Uh, Frost of Texas may have a question. Well, um, a couple of questions. Um, Mr. Stockman, as I recall, uh, your uh, provision was added to one of the banking bills. Is that correct? One of the bills out In of the In addition to this, yes. And uh, those are bills that haven't come up yet, those uh, two bills out of the Banking Committee. Right. Uh, do you know when those will be before us? No, it was part of the reconciliation package. Well, I understand, but uh, that's where you fall and pray to the bird rule. 
if right. I understand you correctly, so that it can't stay in the reconciliation package. Because it's revenue neutral. The, the question, though, I have is, uh, uh, and I don't recall, which of the two banking uh, bills was this attached to? It was, it was in Marge Rofema's uh, bill for, uh, I believe it's for Biff Safe. Mm -hmm. And we will be seeing that at some point. If I understand correctly. Well, you know, I I, uh, I don't know. You know, I thought at some point we were going to see it in the reconciliation bill. I can never uh, mm -hmm. uh, guess where or when the legislation will turn out. Mm -hmm. The uh, Mr. Stockman, uh, as I think that uh, people on this committee may be aware that this is uh, a matter of some controversy in Texas. There is a great deal of support for it. Uh, there also is some opposition, and you might uh, the groups that I'm aware of that are opposed to it. I include the Farm Bureau and, and the Realtors. You might want to comment on, on why they are opposed to your legislation. Well, I, I don't know if you can characterize the Realtors as opposed to it, because I went uh, right after I introduced it in the bank down to the Realtors, and, and I know in Harris County they were very much split on the issue. Mm -hmm. In fact, the, I was told that the Realtors may consider uh, changing their position, so I think that uh, that's an assumption that historically they have been opposed to it, but I know for a fact the people that are actually uh, in the real estate industry are split. Mm -hmm. um, what about the, the Farm Bureau? It was my understanding that they were opposed to it. Well, I understand that the Farm Bureau is, and uh, and there's there again, I uh, have been back to my district and spoke with rice farmers, mm -hmm. and uh, there are some that are for it and some are against, uh, against it. Uh, I think, though, that that is an issue that uh, as, as I spoke to the National Farm Bureau, it's, it's offered in 49 other states, and uh, I think that uh, once it becomes available, they'll too uh, join our board. Well, it is a matter of uh, some contention within my state. Yes. Uh, I have... Uh, our state, yeah. Mm -hmm. Within our state, <laughs> that's correct. And uh, it's uh, a matter that... Um, deserves attention by this Congress, and, and my question really was, my original question was, uh, since it's been offered to uh, one of the banking bills, would that not provide the appropriate vehicle for considering this measure? I, I think any vehicle in which we could give the consumers the power to decide their own finances is the proper vehicle. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Now, could I just ask uh, either one of you, just, just briefly, why um, is Texas the only state? Uh, that does not allow these alternative mortgages. We were fearful of Yankees. Fearful of Yankees? That's what I was told. Yeah, of our New York banks, is that's that right? right. <laughs> there well, is that's honesty, a good answer. In all honesty, it, when, when we, the Constitution was created, they had, we've changed, uh, if the gentleman will correct me, I think we changed the state Constitution about 400 times. In fact, we just changed it yesterday uh, several times. And uh, unlike the National Constitution, Texas continually changes the Constitution, and we actually it was set up for fearful of the uh, carpetbaggers. <laughs> well, that's being very frank. Mr. So Dreyer. are we correct in concluding that you are no longer fearful of Yankees? <laughs> I'm, I'm from Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, thank you very, very thank much for very coming. Much. Appreciate your patience again. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're going to have just a very, very brief recess, and uh, if you can all stay around, uh, we'll be back in just a very few minutes and uh, discuss the rule. Come back to uh, back to order, and the chair will be in receipt of a motion from the gentleman from Tennessee. Mr. Chairman, I move the committee grant HR 2586 <coughs> a temporary increase in the statutory debt limit, a modified closed rule providing for consideration in the House without intervening point of order with one hour of general debate, divided equally between the chairman and ranking minority member of the Committee on Ways and Means. The rule orders a previous question without intervening motion except for those specified in the rule. The rule considered is adopted that amendment recommended by the Committee on Ways and Means and now printed in the bill as well as the, those amendments referenced in the report of the Committee on Rule. 
The rule provides for one motion to amend by the chairman of the committee on ways and means, or each does need, which shall be considered as read, and shall be debatable for 20 minutes, equally divided and controlled by the proponent and an opponent. The rule also provides for one motion to amend by Representative Walker, Pennsylvania, or his designee, which shall be considered as read and shall be debatable for 40 minutes, equally divided and controlled by the proponent and an opponent. The rule also provides for one motion to recommit, which, if it includes instructions, may only be offered by the minority leader or his designee. Finally, the rule provides that during consideration of the bill, no question shall be subject to a demand for division of the question. You've heard the motion from the uh, gentleman from Tennessee. Is there any discussion or amendment to uh, his motion? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Moakley. Chairman, I move the committee make an order of the amendments offered by Representative Gibbons and Representative Payne of Virginia and ask that the amendments be given the appropriate waivers. Very briefly, the Gibbons amendment would replace the short-term increase in the debt limit contained in the bill with a long-term increase in the amount to $5.5 trillion, the same amount the budget resolution recommends and that the reconciliation bill passed by the House requires. The amendment would also remove the provisions regarding investment of trust fund securities and the repeal of the Treasury Department's debt management tools. Mr. Chairman, the Payne Amendment would temporarily extend the debt limit to the latter of either December 12, 1995 or 30 days after the date the President is presented uh, the budget reconciliation for his signature. <laughs> well, Joe, uh, I know both of the, uh, the amendments were offered uh, with good intentions from Mr. Gibbons and Mr. Payne, and we've spoken to that earlier uh, in the evening. Uh, the truth of the matter is, if we were to enact either one of these amendments, it would take away all of the bargaining chips, all of the incentive for the President to sit down and, uh, and negotiate uh, meaningful budget cuts that are going to bring us to a, to a balanced budget. Uh, secondly, both of those amendments really are uh, uh, not necessary if the Solomon Amendment is enacted into this, uh, this resolution. Uh, the Solomon Amendment commits the President and Congress to enact in calendar year 1995 legislation to achieve a balanced budget as scored by CBO by fiscal year 2002 and affirming in intent, the intent of Congress not to enact a further increase in the public debt limit until the president, this is the key part, until the president has signed such legislation. And once he has done that, I would be willing to entertain uh, both of those amendments uh, for any future CRs that might come down because the president then would be committed to, uh, to a balanced budget. Well, Mr. Chairman, the purpose of, of my amendment it's just to allow the people in the entire House to have a vote on it, just to see how they feel about it. I'm not trying to include it as part of the base text of the rule. I would just like to have it out there so it could be voted on by other people than the Select Committee on Rules. Mm -hmm. Well, I think they'll have that opportunity. The entire body is going to vote on this rule. and uh, hopefully on the, on the rule, but they won't be able to vote on the rule with this But that's the main intent of the rule. No, I, I think it's a little different. They may like other parts of the rule, but I think they would like to, a chance at increasing the debt limit just a very, very small. I, I guess it's a matter of opinion, and everybody's entitled to their opinion. So why don't we test everybody's opinion? I'll ask for a roll call. I'd like call. to test everybody's opinion. <laughs> I'll ask for a roll call. Wrong. Uh, could we have a vote on Mr. Uh, Moakley's uh, amendment? Uh, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. No. And evidently the nays have it, and the amendment is not agreed to. That was kind of close, Mr. Chairman. I'd like a roll call vote. Uh, the clerk will call the roll, out of courtesy to Mr. Moakley. Uh, Mr. Willett? No. Uh, Willett votes no, Mr. Dreyer. No. Mr. Dreyer votes no, Mr. Goss. No. Mr. Goss votes no, Mr. Lender. Uh, Ms. Price? No. Ms. Price votes no, Mr. diaz -Villard. No. Mr. diaz -Villard votes no, Mr. Gaines. No. Yes. 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 No. And the clerk will announce the results. And the amendment is not agreed to. Are there further amendments or discussion? 
Mr. Frost. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment to the rule. I move that the committee strike the extraneous measures that are self-executed in this rule. This would include provisions to dismantle the Commerce Department, as well as those dealing with habeas corpus and the com commitment to a seven-year balanced budget. None of these were included in the Ways and Means Reported Bill, and we don't believe they should be added at this juncture. I also move that the amendment offered by Mr. Walker made an order under this rule be stricken from the rule. I would uh, mention, too, that uh, no one uh, appeared before this committee on the habeas corpus provision at all. Uh, I don't believe any witness mentioned that in testimony, uh, and suddenly it, uh, it appears in this rule. Well, it is the identical language uh, that has been in other measures that has been debated many, many times on the floor of Congress. Does the gentleman uh, really mean to strike out uh, my amendment? Yes, I do, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would only observe that uh, in the time that I've served on this committee, uh, I have never seen a debt uh, limit extension uh, Christmas tree the way this one has been done. Well, all, uh, all my amendment does is just uh, require both the Congress and the President to commit to the balanced budget. And, and I understand. Uh, uh, I'd hate to see that, uh, that amendment defeated in this committee, but uh, nevertheless, uh, I guess we, we understand all of the uh, provisions. Yes, I do. Sure it won't be. You can assure me of that? <laughs> well, it makes me feel much better. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Bielens. May, may I just join in my brother from Texas here to, to uh, urge support for this amendment so that people understand, I guess you folks do, but some of the folks listening perhaps may not, that on top of the modestly but not perhaps too, too seriously offensive things that were included in the original bill, which gave us some pause, you are proposing a certain number of mostly extraneous matters, including, of course, abolishing the Commerce Department, which is not that bad an idea, actually. The habeas corpus reform and, and uh, Mr. Walker's, Walker's amendment on regulatory reform, which simply have, as, as Mr. Frost said, no place in, in, in this bill. They, they are moving on their own. They'll be successful, I, I believe, in one form or another on their own uh, in the proper course of legislative action. And I'll just say once more, and uh, you know, it is presumptuous of me, but I wish you folks would learn something from our mistakes in the past. People outside the Beltway do not understand these kinds of maneuvers other than realizing their political games. I don't think it does anybody any good, especially the country in the last analysis, and it's going to hurt the Republicans probably, which I shouldn't complain about, perhaps, but this isn't the right way to go about legislating, I think. And I think it'll come back to haunt you, as when every now and then we did something along these lines, it came back, I think, to haunt us. Is there further discussion to the uh, gentleman's um, amendment? If not, all those in favor of the amendment say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Aye. Nay. And the amendment is not agreed to. Roll call, Mr. Chairman. And a roll call is requested. The clerk will call the roll. Roll call. 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 Yes, Clark votes no. Mrs. No. McGinnis votes no. Mrs. Walt votes no. Mrs. Walt votes no. Mrs. Walt votes no. Mr. Walter? Yes. Walter votes yes. Mr. Bielen? Yes. Mr. Bielen votes yes. Mr. Frost? Yes. Mr. Frost votes yes. Mr. Hall? Yes. Mr. Hall votes yes. Chairman Solomon? No. Chairman Solomon votes no. The clerk will announce the results. And the amendment is not agreed to. Are there further amendments? Mr. F uh, Hall? Mr. Chairman, I, I offer the Geekest Amendment. Mr. Geekus was has been in front of us a number of times. Geekus Amendment is uh, is uh, one of the few things that made sense tonight as we talked about this bill. As far as I was concerned, I, I think I hope that someday that we can adopt this amendment. I think it's a very good idea. It brings common sense to the budget process, and it keeps us from facing these continuing resolutions, these debt limit kinds of bills that we face often. And um, I think the people of this country would really appreciate it if we would pass this amendment, because it would save a lot of time and wear. So I offer his amendment, uh, and it's, it's in order. Uh, I hope that you accept it. Well, as you know, we have uh, great respect for Mr. Geekus. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, regardless of who the president is, uh, if any president uh, always knew that he would uh, get a continuing resolution, 
uh, he'd never have to sign any appropriation bills that contain cuts in his favorite uh, projects like uh, AmeriCorps. I mean, I just uh, vehemently opposed that program. I think it was a great mistake. It took money away from our all-voluntary military and the peacetime GI Bill. It's already reflected on the uh, recruitment in your district, in my district, and all across this country. Uh, and no president would ever have to, to, uh, to uh, sign any bill. I mean, he wouldn't have to negotiate. He would simply go along with these continuing resolutions until he got his way. Well, Jerry, so it has merit, but I... We have a difference of opinion on I, AmeriCorps. So I, I, I know we do. I, I've seen AmeriCorps work in many cities of this country, and many of these, uh, many of these young people are working with poor people. They're really doing an amazing job. I probably met over 100 of them individually. And I really disagree with you because... Uh, this is not a free lunch these kids are doing. They work very, very hard. They're doing a great job. And no, I, I, it would be a shame if this program gets eliminated. Well, it's paid volunteerism, and I don't believe in paid volunteerism. But uh, You don't believe in the Peace Corps? Uh, unless it's in defense of the United States of America. What do you military. think the Peace Corps is all about? I mean, the right. Peace Corps is one of the best programs we have. And that's, that's uh, you would call that paid volunteerism, wouldn't you? It's a paid volunteer. Well, that's not necessarily paid volunteerism, but uh, nevertheless, I think we understand the amendment. If there's no further discussion, all those in favor will say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Aye. And uh, the nays have it. The amendment is not agreed to. Uh, a roll the, call, uh, Mr. Chair. A roll call is requested, and the clerk will call the roll. Yes. 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 Uh, no. Uh, the clerk will announce the results. And the amendment is not agreed to. Are there further amendments? Mr. Chairman. Porter. Oh, I'm sorry. No. no. Uh, Mr. Bielanson. This is our fourth and I think our last amendment, Mr. Chairman. We do. We have what the next to last. Mr. Bills, you may Thank proceed. You. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment to the rule. The amendment would strike from the bill the provisions regarding the investment of trust fund securities and the repeal of the Treasury Department's debt management tools. Um, I think it's self-explanatory. It would, in effect, delete sections two and three of the bill to which the Treasury objects because it claims, I think, we think correctly, it would limit its flexibility and its management ability to, to deal with this problem, which is going to be a problem no matter how well we deal with it at this end. I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, and I shan't argue it further. I would ask, however, because it might be useful to, to folks, if at this point in the record, perhaps, Mr. Chairman, we might submit a statement of the administration's policy on the bill because it speaks to this very proposal that I'm making here. But Without objection, such would, will be the order. Would, would a gentleman, uh, gentleman yield for a question? Mr. Of course. Does, does, this, uh, does this get into the, the Treasury's ability to dip into the Social Security trust yes. funds? Yes, it does. If the gentleman will take a look at sections two and three. That's what I thought it did. Yeah. Okay. Yes, absolutely. No, as, no. as you know, I would be pretty much opposed to that. I know you would. I might, too, if I were from Florida. Well, I think... No, I'm kidding. I, I, kidding. Forget it's it. It's not just Florida. There's people involved... I understand. I'm sorry I said that. <laughs> yeah. You're talking like a candidate. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> okay. well, uh, a lot of people involved in that particular program in this country. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, anyway, Mr. Chairman, prior to voting on this amendment, uh, I'd like to submit, if I may, statement of administration policy and the statement of the Treasury Secretary uh, with respect to this portion of the bill. Without objection. No. Well, Tony, I'd like oh, yes, to... Let me just say this thing, seriously. Mm -hmm. It was brought to my attention just now by staff, but just so Mr. Goss will feel better anyway, no matter what happens, and we all do, as a matter of fact, in sum, this administration will not use Social Security trust funds for any purpose other than to assure the payment of benefits to Social Security recipients. So Mr. Solomon and I and the other older members of this Mr. Bulkley, of course. Well, then you should a lot better. Then you shouldn't object to the amendment. Is I that, mean, you shouldn't you object, should object to the provision. To my amendment. No, <laughs> why your no, amendment but, but becomes that needless? But that's a major portion of it. Uh, order. Okay, major but, but it's a serious byproduct, Tony. Except that it's not because they're not going to use it for those purposes. If you were the Treasury Secretary, if you could craft this, this amendment too, in that, a way that wouldn't affect the Social Security, I'd feel better. I might not support it. Understand? But I would feel better. I understand. Well, I think you should feel better because it's not going to affect Social Security, and you don't need to support it, so you should feel good that way, too. Well, what, uh, what trust funds is he going to dip into? I don't know. 
Hmm? Maybe he won't at all. That's not the, well, that's uh, not the hmm. thrust of their concern, oh, Mr. Chairman. Maybe. The thrust of their concern, as the gentleman knows, and no need to argue this at great length. No, it, but it, it, uh, tell well, me it's a point because, uh, you know, monies that are paid into trust funds are put there in trust. And, I mean, is he going to dip into the uh, retirement trust funds of uh, federal employees? I mean, what's the, you know, I, well, I, I don't think it's worth carrying on, but uh, well, I, I would just argue against the amendment. Any no, further no, the exact, exact same trust funds that prior presidents, Mr. Bush, Mr. Reagan, and others have had the flexibility to deal with under prior debt limitation uh, uh, agreements. They ought to keep their hands out of them. Anyway, if there's no further discussion, all those in favor of the amendment will say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. No. Nay. No. And the amendment is not agreed to, and the gentleman respectfully asked for a roll call. We would, uh, I would respectfully ask the clerk to call the roll. Uh, Mr. Quillen? No. Quillen votes no. Mr. Dreyer? No. Mr. Dreyer votes no. Mr. Goss? No. Mr. Goss votes no. Mr. Rogers? No. Leonard votes no. Mr. Price? No. Mr. Price votes no. Mr. Diaz-Dwarf? No. Mr. Diaz-Dwarf votes no. Mr. McGinnis? No. Mr. McGinnis votes no. Mr. Walpole? No. Mr. Walpole votes no. Mr. Walpole votes no. Mr. Walpole votes no. Mr. Walpole votes no. Yes. Yes. No. The clerk will announce the results. Strike. Four yeas, nine nays. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Uh, just one moment, Jim. Uh, the amendment is not agreed to. Are there further amendments to the uh, gentleman's motion? Mr. Mr. Chairman. Quillen. Oh. Mr. Quillen first. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, the rule before I move at the third line where it says minority member of the Committee on Appropriation be changed to the minority member of the Committee on Ways and Means. If you look at the uh, back page. Era, and, what's up to so it's just of the rule itself. They've got language from yesterday's rule. Exactly. Oh. The exact yeah. we we have have no, motion was correct. We have no objection to that, Mr. Chairman. Right. And uh, all, all in favor of the gentleman's amendment will say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. And there are no nays. The amendment is agreed to. Mr. Frost. Mr. Chairman, uh, I move that the rule be amended by striking the provision of the rule allowing Chairman Archer to offer an amendment that has not been seen by this committee nor printed. Uh, this is the amendment uh, referenced on page two of the draft rule, uh, numbered two. Well, it, as the gentleman is, knows, uh, yesterday uh, I offered an amendment, or, or no, I should say Mr. Linder offered an amendment uh, that would strike that same language because it was not needed and was not expected to be used. Uh, in this particular case, if you notice, we have not waived any points of order against any such amendment that might be offered because uh, I have some real problems with that myself, and uh, I want to see the legislation. Uh, in this particular case, since it would be germane uh, to the issue, we felt that uh, we would allow it to go through but not waive the points of order. So if it were, if it were in question in any way, points of order could be laid against it. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, uh, of course, I have a copy of the letter sent to the committee by Mr. Archer, and he doesn't request, in his letter, he didn't request uh, this amendment. No, but he did to, to me earlier. Um, I, I don't believe that he requested it no, to the, the committee. The majority leader. Mm -hmm. uh, I would only observe, as I did yesterday, mm -hmm that uh, the only reason for having an amendment like this is uh, concern on your side that you may not have the votes and that you may have to uh, attract some votes at the last minute in order to get a majority. Uh, I think it's um, unfortunate that we don't have any inkling as to what would be in this amendment, that we, uh, that we don't have any inkling as to what would be in this amendment. Uh, you're asking this committee to uh, grant carte blanche to the chairman of the committee. Well, I would just say to the gentleman uh, that uh, when we have open rules, we have no idea what the amendments are going to be, and we are seeing to it that the amendments, uh, if they are offered, 
are germane to the issue, uh, just as, uh, as if it would be under an open rule. So, uh, of course, this is not an open rule. Now, why don't you knows. commend us for not uh, waiving the points of as, order against as, these unseen amendments? As, as, the chairman, <laughs> as, as the chairman knows, this is not an open rule. He's right. commending you, but he's asking for a vote. <laughs> okay. okay, I think the minority member uh, uh, leader is asking for a vote. All those in favor of the Frost Amendment will say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Nay. Yes, the roll, amendment roll, is roll not call, agreed Mr. to, Mr. and a roll call is requested. The clerk will call the roll. To. If there are no further amendments to the uh, gentleman's motion, we will now vote on reporting the resolution to the floor. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed, nay. No. Uh, we didn't hear too many nays, but. Uh, we'll have a roll call just to make sure you'll <laughs> The know gentleman asked for a roll call vote. Uh, the clerk will call the roll. Aye. Aye. the results and uh, the resolution is reported and <laughs> mr. the chairman uh, Solomon will carry for the majority Gentleman from Ohio and mr. Hall will carry for the minority very, very good mr. dryer well we uh, do not expect to meet tomorrow uh, there is a um, I've just been informed that the uh, ICC legislation that was pulled from our schedule earlier uh, may be available tomorrow, and we aren't sure yet. Um, they, we were going to schedule a meeting for 10, but I doubt very much if it would be ready. Therefore, uh, we will set a tentative hour of 2 p.m. to consider it. It won't take long if and when uh, it is ready for us to consider. Mr. Uh, Chairman, do you have any idea what time the House is in tomorrow? I believe the House goes in at 10 a.m. tomorrow. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Um, Frost. since uh, scheduling of the House uh, is the prerogative of the majority, I would ask if you could give us any hint as to uh, what the situation will be on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday of this week. Well, I don't know about the, uh, about the gentleman, but I have, uh, that happens to be Veterans Day weekend, and I have Very a full schedule. And, uh, I think, as do most members, I'm hopeful that we're going to be able to uh, to meet those schedules back home in the district. Uh, mm -hmm. I've had enough of this place for one week, and I'd like to go home. But uh, yeah, I don't here. believe we're going to be here. I think we'll be out of here Thursday night, and we will come back early on Monday at any rate because uh, both of these issues, the continuing resolution that we did today on the floor and this in, uh, debt ceiling extension that we're going to do tomorrow, are contentious, and uh, no doubt we will have to be back here uh, quite early on Monday. And we might expect a Rules Committee meeting as early as 4 o'clock on Monday. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, for matters to be brought up on the floor on Monday, if they were to be brought up in the Rules Committee on Monday, of course you would require a two-thirds vote to consider them the same day. Yes. Is it your anticipation that <coughs> we might consider those on the floor the same day they would be considered in committee? No, we do not expect any matters to come before this committee on Monday that we would bring up the same day. So that while the committee might be meeting on Monday, we would not necessarily have floor votes on Monday? On no, but uh, I believe that uh, the majority leader will announce a schedule tomorrow that uh, might have suspensions and other, or other matters uh, available. Uh, which uh, might require votes on Monday in order to get the members back here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank Mr. you. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Dryer. I, I'd just like to observe that when I was in the chair downstairs, you came up to me and told me that tonight's meeting would last 30 minutes. 
And it's now five minutes of 11. I just wanted the record to show that. <laughs> well, I'm glad you took me out behind the woodshed, David. <laughs> Thanks very much. Meeting is adjourned. No, thanks. I, 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 no, it's the one I mean. Thanks. 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 Later this morning, debt limit extension reaches the House floor. Under the bill, the debt limit would rise from $4.9 trillion to $4.97 trillion. The U.S. House returns at 10 a.m. Eastern Time. You can watch live gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage here on C-SPAN. The Senate returns today at 10 a.m. Eastern Time. Morning business, when members can speak on any subject, runs for two hours, around noon Eastern Time.